Four Star Playhouse presents Dick Powell, Charles Boyer, David Niven, Ida Lupino, This is how the other half lives, huh? I like it. I was referring to the other half, not the future better half. If you call me the better half when we're married, I'll leave you. <laughs> I'm capable of even lower forms of inspiration. I might refer to you as the wife. <laughs> nice. Part of the so-called sidewalk syndrome. Is that Kramer Cleveland over there? I wouldn't know. It is Kramer. Oh, swell. Stunning looking blonde with him. What'd you say? If I say yes, you'll say I'm a cad. If I say no, you'll think I'm being disagreeable. Oh, she is funny. Oh. Well, not bad. Hmm? The blonde. Not bad. Oh. Poor Kramer. His play is closing already. Poor Kramer. That's what I should have gotten you for our engagement present. A gold cigarette case. Oh, I'd just have lost it. And a lighter. I'd have lost that, too. Incorrigible? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> you aren't just a tiny bit miffed because I tried to agree that Kramer Washington's doll was a doll, are you? Kramer Cleveland. Oh, well, I was close. I do get annoyed at your indifference at the things that mean something to some people. I'm not indifferent. I'm just bored. I've seen it all before in the newsreels. Dan, did it ever occur to you that in your own way you're a snob? Me? Subway society? Yours is a snobby of a self-made man. A plugger who came up the hard way. Walking the police beat. Becoming chief of detectives and... then studying law to become district attorney. This is real bad? It's wonderful, Dan. And I'm very proud of you. You can be tried. Well, wait till we've been married three or four years. All those little differences will be ironed out. Marriage like war is a mighty leveler. I wonder, will marriage level us? Or will one of us level the other? I wonder which of us will be the stronger. Well, obviously, the one who gets up the earliest and takes possession of the bathroom. I'm serious, Daniel. Supposing it ever became a contest of will and character between us, who'd win? The man who got there by sheer force of will and ambition? Or the uptown girl who got there because her parents were there in the first place? Who'd win? Is it important? I think it's something we should find out about before we're married. Well, it is kind of a mixed up marriage. The smooth, smooth hands and the rough, rough neck. Comes under the heading of, uh, are we good for each other? Well, I have a scheme. We start a contest. A legion of well wishes, tear off the top of some nice juicy scandal and send it in with a letter that starts with, I think Dan Morgan and Lisa Quincy are good for each other because. I'm not going to be interrogated about the stunning brunette with Haskell Beecher. I, I didn't see him come in. I did. Then we stayed. You didn't ask me to leave. We're here. Take me home. You know, Lisa, this may have happened at a very apt moment, a case in point you might say. I have every reason to dislike Haskell Beecher as much as you. Disliked? He hurt me badly a couple of times. You've never met my kid brother, Larry. You probably never will. He's got a prison record. He stays out of sight. Beecher was the cause of his going to prison. I also dislike him for what he did to you. My father would be alive today if it hadn't been for Beecher. It wasn't only the stock swindle who broke him. He brooded about what Beecher did to his daughter, isn't that the... We're never going to talk about that. Now, please take me home. Lisa, my dear, how nice. Dan, how are you? Good enough. Are you drink? No, I've... Uh... 
Got a girl waiting. You can buy my lunch tomorrow. I've wanted to talk to you. What about? A couple of threatening calls I've gotten lately. Why don't you tell the police? When I can go first class? This is especially for you, Dan. I've uh, heard the happy news. We've got things to talk about, Dan. I'll pick you up at the office, 12.30ish. Okay. You look lovely. Good night. Good night. You asked him to join us. Not a pretty good idea he'd refuse. And if he hadn't? A waiter, would you bring my check, please? Well, if he hadn't, you'd have faced it out. Because you uptown girls have a special class along with your special snootiness. Keep it. Supposing I'd left the table. Well, then I'd one points to the contest. Better discipline, self control. Or more a brazen hypocrisy, you mean. You can't defeat your enemy by avoiding him. Are you going to have lunch with him? Well, shouldn't I? You didn't threaten him. I'm not afraid of what he might say about you. Temper, temper. Oh, I've uh, got to stop by headquarters for a while. Want to join me? No, I want to go home. All right, Lisa. stupid. Shooting me won't settle anything. You'd be in all sorts of difficulty. Why don't you put away that stylish little weapon and let's sit down and talk the whole thing over since How soon did you get here after the shooting, would you say? Wouldn't have been more than five minutes after people here heard the shots. Mm -hmm. Anything but touched? Not a thing. Call the coroner? On his way. Well, you better start running up the suspects. Pizza wasn't popular. There's going to be a crowd. I know. I don't care. Get them all in. What about witnesses? We may be in a little luck. Good. I want to talk to them. out of bed. Oh, you didn't. I was reading. What are you oh, reading? No, thanks. Oh, just an article, magazine. Can I have a drink? Of course. A mutual acquaintance of ours lost his health tonight. Haskell Beecher is dead. Shot twice. I'm not surprised. Well? Somebody was bound to do it sometime. 
Somebody surely did it a couple of hours ago. Well, I can't say I'm sorry. I'm not. I can only say that I'm sorry, but I'm rather glad. Why are you here, then? What did you really do after I left you? Did you go out anywhere? Is this your way of saying that I killed Haskell Beecher? Well, I didn't. That's a pretty big chip you're carrying on your shoulder. And that's a large insinuation you're making. Oh, Lisa, Lisa, I need your help. You didn't kill him, did you? I almost wish I had. How odd. Why? Oh. Did I drop that in your car? No, you didn't drop it in the car. You left it in Haskell Beach's apartment. You were there tonight, weren't you? You're not going to tell me you weren't there. Do you want a confession? Is there one? I was at Beecher's, but I didn't shoot him. Is that all you want to tell me? I know you too well to imagine that you'd give me any more consideration than you'd give a stranger under suspicion. I can't quarrel with that. But I can't say any more until I've had legal advice. I've already shown you more consideration than I would a stranger. I've got your glove. I'm concealing evidence. And I won't conceal it long. Now, will you do something for me? What is it? Don't leave town. I wouldn't get very far, would I? I wouldn't like hunting you down like a common criminal. But you do it. Why don't you arrest me? Go ahead, you're a cop. You've got the evidence, I had the motive. You've got your duty and a great big career mapped out for yourself. Go ahead, arrest me. I don't want to arrest you. Don't worry, I won't run. I wouldn't know how. Be in my office at 10 o'clock in the morning. Statement of witnesses at the scene of the crime. You know all about that. Yeah. Uh, fingerprints. No, the killer apparently wore gloves. Yeah. And this report came from ballistics ten minutes ago. Yeah. Miss Quick, to see you. Send her in. Let me know if there's anything else you need. Thanks, Lieutenant. Come in, Miss Quincy. Lisa. Got two more prospects lined up for you down at the line. Thank you. Sit down, Lisa. Was I lucky not to have been swept up with the rest of the suspects, or uh, do I have influence? As a matter of routine, I'll ask you, Lisa, did you kill Haskell Beecher? As a matter of routine, and as a matter of fact, I did not kill Haskell Beecher. Do you want me to repeat that under oath? Let it go. I just need the point to start from. A minor point, I suppose. How nice of you to explain. Oh, cut it out, Lisa. Can't you drop that guard just once and give a guy a break? Give a guy a break. All right, all right. That's the way I talk when my guard is down. I got it from the gas house set. Now, I'll ask you another question, and maybe we can sneak out of here, have a nice, quiet lunch, and forget the whole thing. That's a nice prospect. All right, all right. Now, you didn't kill Beecher. You mean assuming I didn't, don't you? All right, all right, assuming you didn't. Then who did kill him? Why ask me? Because I think you know. It's absurd. I don't think it's absurd at all. Haskell lived in an apartment building. Several people heard the shots. Two people witnessed a woman leaving the scene right after hearing the shots. And here are their statements. I'll read them to you. I was walking my dog when I heard what sounded like a couple of heavy books landing flat on the floor inside the building. And then this woman ran out the front way. She was wearing an evening dress. Though not very long. I'm sure it was some kind of evening dress, though. I didn't think anything about it until I heard the police sirens and I came back around the block. Etc. Et Here's a note. I was coming up in the elevator. It must have been a little after one in the morning. Well, there were these shots. I knew they were shots all right. And just as the elevator gets to the second floor, the door opens and I see this woman running down the hallway toward the stairs. I believe I would know her again if I saw her. She was quite nice looking. How sweet. You can't beat us on this, Lisa. We know. Why don't you ask your witnesses who the killer was? Because the witnesses didn't see the killer. They saw you. Why didn't they see him? That's a good question. 
If we were so close together, why didn't anybody see him? Oh, Lisa, Lisa. We've planned and plotted this thing right down to the split second. We've assembled the entire picture. You saw the murder, but the witnesses didn't for perfectly obvious reasons. Because a man will instinctively try to escape by unconventional means, thinking his strength and physique will help him. A woman most always uses normal channels. Now, I think the killer left by the fire escape away from the witnesses, and you ran toward them. They'd have had to see you, and you must have seen the killer. How simple and clever it all seems. Yeah. If correct. Yeah. If correct. Dan. Don't you think it's correct? All this intricate... Theory? It's clever and ingenious. But you don't believe it. You want to believe all this contrivance about people seeing me and... My seeing the killer, but you don't. You think I did it, don't you, Dan? It's a good theory. All right. After you left last night, I telephoned Haskell. I said I had to see him at once. He was charming. How nice of me to call. He'd been thinking of me fondly all evening. Would you please come over, Lisa? It'll be like old times, remember? Remember. How I remember. All the loathing I ever felt for him came out of me last night when he spoke to us. All the memories. I must have been mad, but I wanted to see Haskell Beecher die. I wanted him to die very, very much. For all the hurt and fear he caused. Then he wanted to have lunch with you. To talk about me, no doubt. Dan. Dan, last night I was terrified. I, I must have gone insane. I, when I went to his apartment, I put a gun in my evening bag. When I got there, the door was half open. I pushed it wide open. Just as I did, I heard two shots. A man came running toward me and pushed me down. He fell, he got up and ran out. I knew Haskell was dead. He had to be. And how he deserved it. I got up and ran home. That's all, Dan. Yes, Mr. Beecher got a late telephone call, went through my board. Let's see. Must be it was around a quarter to one. It was a lady. Switchboard off at Beecher's apartment. Look, Dan. It's never been fired. And I mean never. 25 automatic. Beecher was shot with a 38. All right. Our theory does hold water. You saw the killer. Got a good look at him. Who was he? I don't know. Could you identify him at a lineup? No. Look, Lisa, unless you help us, an enemy of the people, a murderer will escape justice. And I don't care what the provocation was. He killed somebody. I'm sorry, Dan. Lisa, Lisa, it isn't easy to send a man to his death, even a murderer. I hate it, but it's the job, and I'm trying to do it to the best of my conscience and my ability. Of course. Honest Dan Morgan. Without reproach, without fear. He doesn't want to send a man to a chair, but he doesn't mind if I do. How gallant. How charming. Well, I, this is it. The contest. The uptown Yankees versus the gas house boys. Remember our little discussion last night about the championship for you or me? Or in the nice eye of nature, which breed is the best? Oh, Dan, if you care anything about me, it'll all stop tormenting me like this. Tormenting you? It'll ruin everything between us. You won't face the lineup. All right, Lisa. Good enough. Your relationship with the law will be on a strictly formal basis from now on. Strictly impersonal. Goodbye, Lisa. Goodbye. Well, what else is there? I'm a cop. I can't go on with you knowing you're shielding a murderer. Dan, in your courts there's a saying. Only they're your courts, too. Forgive me for being stuffy about it. The courts have a saying that the accuser must come to the bar of justice with clean hands. Can't you understand that? Morally speaking, I'm a murderer. I can't condemn a man for a crime that I wanted to commit. Can't you understand that? Or is it all too subtle and theoretical for you? 
The gas house gang may have been short on culture, but not on simple human understanding. In a pretty fair moral sense, what you're saying from your side of the tracks is that you owe a killer some cockeyed sort of loyalty because you both shared the same purpose, murder. No, Dad. What else? It's the blood bond of the underworld. It's the street. It's the ethics of children. It's kid code. No, Dan. It's let he who is without sin among us cast the first stone. Or the devil quoting scripture. It's Lisa Quincy, nice girl, saying she won't squeal on a murderer. Saying she won't be a dirty stool pigeon. Don't you see? I can't. I, I just can't. Which side are you on, Lisa? One more arrest. One more big pinch. One more conviction. One more charge to a man's body. Stop it. Then another rung up the ladder to assistant DA, district attorney. Who knows? Even mayor, governor, or a senator. <laughs> There's no end to your opportunities once you've made enough important arrests. Stop it. I'm sorry, Daniel. I... It's not your fault. It, it's mine. But I can't help it. I... I just can't tattle. Tattle? Oh, so that's it. Tattle. Listen, dear, I know how you feel about informing, if that's what you want to call it. None of us like to tell, to tattle. Ever since we could talk and were able to snitch on sister, that's been the code. We didn't squeal, we didn't snitch, we didn't tattle. And it stays with us, we can't help it. And don't I know it. I face it every day in my job. But we're not kids anymore, Lisa. An adult society finds justice in the testimony of witnesses when a crime has been committed. We're not kids. Mentally, a criminal is a kid. Or sick, but not us. But my hands are dirty. What are you doing? Moving, quitting. Under the circumstances, I can't stay here. Giving up your work, the struggle, everything? The fiance of the chief of detectives has vital knowledge concerning a capital crime. The chief of detectives can't make her talk. That could either be collusion or just plain incompetence, and that's not what I get paid for. Now, that may be too subtle or too theoretical for you, but I seem to get it all right. All your life, you'll hate me. Then, when can I see the lineup? This afternoon, 2 o'clock. That's all. All right, the light dazzles them. They can't see us. Turn left. Is the man you Turn saw right. running out of Beecher's apartment among those men or not? And be sure. Turn right ahead. Are they all suspects? Yep. Pick one or none. Number three. You sure? I'm sure. Last, number three. See if you can get a confession out of it. <laughs> Don't feel badly, dear. You had to do it. I guess this has been the contest between us, hasn't it? Will against will, character against character. Sorry it took me so long to face up to it. Gave you a tough time, too. But it was just the thought of sending a man to prison, or maybe even to his death. Yes, Sergeant? Prisoner made a full confession. His death. If you kill a man, you have to pay for it. Who is he? He's my brother. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Four Star Playhouse and all the members of the Bristol Myers organization, 
thank you for being with us this evening. I hope you enjoyed our play and that you'll be with us again next week. Good night. Playhouse presents Dick Powell, Charles Boyer, David Niven, Ida Lupino. Dick Powell in Detective's Holiday. Ten minutes if you left and you said you were going. Three hours and seven minutes. <laughs> Thought it'd never get you up here, Dave. How long are you going to stay? Oh, until I'm rested, completely rested. Tired? Bushed. Yeah, big city strain. All that noise, rushing about, and steel racetrack. You know, doctors down there make a fortune just telling people to take things easy. Had one up here last month, exhausted. Wouldn't listen to the doctors, huh? Wouldn't listen. <laughs> he was one of the doctors. <laughs> <laughs> I got a place for you to stay. Good. Back in the hills a bit. Yeah, young feller and his wife, Esau and Doris Hepburn. Couple of kids, good hunting, a nearby fishbowl stream, and no telephone. That's for me. <laughs> oh, uh, what'd you tell him about me? Nothing. Just a feller from the city and a friend of mine. That the way you wanted it? That's the way I want it. Keep that for me, will you? Yeah, sure. You follow me out, and I'll show you the way. Good. Like it? Ah, it's a picture book. Nothing here to think about except nothing. Where's your luggage? In the back. Hang on! Hang on! Hang on! Here they are. <laughs> Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone. This is John. This is Maddie. This is Dave Robinson. Hi, Hi. boys. Hi. Where's your pop? Inside. All right. Hey, pop, it's stuck. Hey, pop, it's stuck in our new border. Doris? How are you, Doc? Uh, hello, Esau. Dave Robinson, he's all Hepburn. Hello, Mr. Hepburn. Welcome, Mr. Robinson. Thank nice you. See, you met the boys. Yeah, I have a feeling if I stick with them, I'll find all the game is hidden in the mountains. Oh, here's the missus. Doris Hepburn, Dave Robinson. How do you do, Mr. Robinson? Welcome to our home. Thank you, Mrs. Hepburn. Very nice of you to put me up here. I'll try to be as little bother as possible. How long are you going to stay? Yeah. Shh, boys, boys, take, take Mr. Robinson's bag to his room. I want the big boy. Oh, yeah. Oh, here, 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 here. Come on now, come on. It's a little wild up here in the morning, Mr. Robinson. I hope you're not a late sleeper. Oh, I'm going to like it here, I'm sure. I'm very grateful to you. Well, I have something on the stove. Excuse me. Well, i got to be getting back up to the office. I'll take these, Doc. Say goodbye to Doris for me, will you? I will. Excuse me, I'll walk to the car with Doc. Honey, what's the matter? He saw he's a policeman. What's he doing here? A policeman? Are you sure? Uh -huh. I know it. I've seen him or his picture or something. So what are we going to do? Nothing. You're not sure, and until you are, we can't do anything. Now, come on, take it easy. Seem like nice people. Yeah, best. Wonderful boys. Sure are. Doris isn't their real mother. He saw his wife died several years ago. 
He met Doris last year on a trip to the city. Fell in love with her, married law. Yeah, they wanted me to step into the district attorney's office next year as assistant. Hmm. What's the matter with that? Nothing. Just haven't made up my mind yet. One of the reasons I took a vacation, of course, if you didn't think about it. You think a vacation is nothing but to hurry off to someplace else, take all your problems with you, and think about them in different surroundings. <laughs> no. I'm going to rest. I'm going to do a little fishing, a little hunting, a lot of sleeping, a lot of eating, and do a little thinking on the side. There. You see there? You're plumb wore out with work and worry. If you don't stop everything, you're going to crack up good. You drop in my office tomorrow. I'll give you a couple of pills and some more advice. Okay, Doc. I'll do just that. Take it easy. You bet. Thanks Come for on. bringing me up. Hmm? I like the feel of this one. You can handle it well. Put another shell in, when you're ready, just holler, pull. How fast does a quail fly? Oh, just about like that. Hey, you don't shoot like a city fella. I'll tell you a little secret. When I found out in the service you got time off for top score, I became an expert. Pull! Must have kept in practice. Pull! Being a sporting good business, huh? <laughs> One of them gun manufacturers? Pull! Might even own a shooting gallery, but I don't. Pull! Sure I can't warm up your coffee, Mr. Robinson? Uh, no, thank you. Maybe you'd like something stronger. Oh, no, thank God. Perfectly happy just to sit here in front of the fire. Say, boys, you ever notice how the flames make pictures? I just saw the monster with two big horns. See him in the corner there? Ah. Uh, oh, he's gone. You know, the Indians used to tell fortunes by watching the flames dance. Tell my fortune. The only trouble is that if they didn't like the fortune, they always threw the fortune teller into the fire. I promise not to. Ah, oh, quiet, Matty. You're so tired now, you can't keep your eyes open. He doesn't have trouble keeping his mouth open. Are you? Hey, watch it. Tell my mommy's fortune. <laughs> Looks like I got myself into something, huh? All right, Maddie, I'll uh, tell you mommy's fortune. I'll look in the fire, both of you go on. There, see? There's a tall flame with light hair standing next to a little boy. Mommy didn't always have light hair. Hey. Oh, Maddie, don't tell your mommy secrets. What's wrong with changing hair? It doesn't hurt the fortune, does it, Dave? Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson? Oh, I shouldn't think so. Kids are the darnest, I tell you. You see, two years ago, when Doris and I got married, well, we thought kids being blonde... And... It wasn't two years ago, Daddy. You brought Mommy back from the city only a little over a year ago. Yeah! <laughs> well, now you have Mr. Robinson so confused you couldn't tell anybody's fortune. Oh, come on, Mr. Robinson. What do you see that's going to happen? Well, I'll tell you one thing about fortunes, Matty. If you're going to look ahead happily, you've got to make sure you never have to look back. Boy, I wish I could tell fortunes. Well, you could if you knew the secret of the fortune teller. What's the secret of the fortune teller? Well, uh, the moment you start to tell somebody's fortune, they tell you. All right, boys, time for bed. Oh, come no, on, come no. on. Oh. Kiss your mom. Good night. I'll tuck them in. Good night, boys. Come on. Good night. Good. I'll take the dishes away. Hi, Doc. Howdy, Dave. How you been? Can't complain. Gotta make a little long distance call, you mind? Oh, sure I did. Help yourself. How you getting along? Oh, well, fine, fine. Got a little headache. You, you got a couple of aspirin? Sure, I'll get them right away for you. Hello? Oh, hello, uh, operator. Could you get me State 7-2000, please, in Capital City? 
Yes, yes, that's right. All right, this is, uh, what's the number here, Doc? 214. Well, this is 214. Yes, that's right, 72,000. Have you called me back? Thank you. Well, you've been here two days now, and already you're calling the office. <laughs> Some vacation. Thanks, Doc. Doc. Hmm? When did you say Esau brought Doris Hepburn up from Capital City? Oh, a little better than a year ago. Why? All right, Doc, I'll give it to you straight. I think there's a warrant outstanding for Doris Hepburn under another name. What are you talking about, Dave? Two young fellows were caught robbing a liquor store. There was a girl in the car who may or may not have been the lookout. Oh, not Doris. It couldn't have been Doris. Well, I certainly hope not. Hello? Yes, yes. Oh, uh, extension 620, please. Oh, hiya, Steve. Dave, you lucky dog. How does it feel to be a man of leisure? Well, why don't you find out? You can make it up here in three hours if you watch the speed limit. Grab yourself a weekend. You deserve it. I'll tell the commissioner you said so. Maybe you'll lend me a sleeping bag. Well, you never know. In the meantime, I want you to do me a favor. You remember that West End liquor store job? Yeah. And the girl we thought was driving the car? Yeah. Send me that photo of her, will you? Why, you got something? I may have. Send me everything he got on. I care of Doc Hendricks, Sierra Blanca. Thought you were on a vacation. I thought so, too. Oh, uh, Steve, have the lab man retouch the photo so she comes out blonde, huh? Blonde? That's right. Send everything as soon as you can. Right away. I'll be seeing you. You mind it, Ned? Goodbye, Dave. So long, Steve. What happens? What happens, Dave, if it is Doris? Well, I take her in. Isn't that what you taxpayers put up your money for? I wonder. And I led you to her. Led you right into her house. And I fixed her up good. Doc, somebody fixed Doris up long before you did. Who? Doris. What's the matter? Oh, just uh, let me rest here for a second, will you? That last hill got me. I, I'm... You don't look so good. I'll be all right in a minute, I, I think. I... Maybe you'd better go back to the city where you got somebody to look after you. You never can tell what's liable to happen to a guy up here. Well, I, 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 I feel all limp inside. I, I, I don't know whether I could make it back to the city or not. <laughs> Cracked like an old plaster pitcher. First infection came along, hit him like a plague. Virus pneumonia. Can be simple, can be serious. In this case, it's serious. What can we do? Well, I wouldn't like to move him. The nearest hospital's over 100 miles from here. Moving him there might make it touch and go. I'd rather keep the odds more favorable where I can. I'll take care of him. You ever had any nursing experience? Yes. Might be day and night for both of us. It's a crisis anyway. I know. I can still move him. You're home, Esau. He can stay. Doc, anything I can do? Do you have a Bible? Yeah. Read it.
Where have I been, Doc? <laughs> you tell me. I was scared a couple times, I know that. Me too. It's all right now, Dave. Thanks to a lot of heart, a lot of prayer, and a lot of woman. Doris, I... I uh... I can't seem to remember anything but Doris. She must have spent every minute with me. She didn't miss many. I gave her a pill yesterday afternoon. She's still sleeping. How can I ever repay? You can't, Dave. If you had a million dollars and gave it to her, you'd still owe her a lot. Oh. Incidentally, here's a letter that came for you while you were sick. You know, one of the things I remember about the girl we're looking for is she'd been a student nurse. Goodbye, Dave. Doc, wait a minute. What do you expect me to do? Be glad that you're still alive. Yes, I thought I'd leave late this afternoon. Aw, oh, gee, Dave. What you have to go back to the city for? I have to work for a living, Maddie. Work? That must be terrible. Say, I was thinking. What's that, Maddie? When you first came here, you started to tell my mommy's fortune. But you never finished. Oh, now, Maddie, please. Wait a minute, Doris. I think maybe I want to hear that fortune, too. Say, I remember in a movie once, there was this fortune teller. It was like an Indian with a thing around his head, a towel or something. And he wouldn't tell the person's fortune because he was afraid it was going to be bad. Did you see something bad in Mommy's fortune? Well, uh, Maddie, fortunes are funny things. It's stuck! Boys! an old friend of yours, Dave. Hello, Dave. Hi, Steve. I made it. The commissioner gave me the weekend, but he wouldn't give me a sleeping bag. Well, Steve, this is Mrs. Hepburn, Steve O'Brien, Doris. How do you do? How do you do? And Mr. Hepburn, see? How do you do? How are you? The rest of the family. You a friend of Dave's? Yeah, I'm a real good friend of Dave's. We're partners. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Gee, that's great. Dave's real smart. He tells fortunes. He does, huh? He, he looks in the fire and... Now, Maddie, you can tell Mr. O'Brien about the fortune telling some other time. Here, fellas, come on in the kitchen. Help me, huh? Let me have your things. Thanks, Doc. I hear you were sick. Doc tells me we almost lost you. Yeah, I was on the short end there for a while, but Mrs. Hepburn fixed that. Well, excuse me. Certainly. Three men in the kitchen. I understand just what you mean. When do you think you're going to leave? Well, that's I want to talk to you. Excuse me, Doc. Yeah. Ah, it sure is beautiful up here. Well, yeah. it's real nice. It's too bad. What is it? Mrs. Hepburn. Doc told me all about it, how much she did for you. It's going to make it tough to take her in. You got my letter. Yeah. Well, she's a girl. No. Oh, come on. I spotted her the minute I stepped into the room. I mean it, she's not the girl. But Dave, the photograph. That girl in there is not the same person in the photograph. She doesn't live the same way, think the same way. Her whole life is different. She's happily married with a couple of wonderful kids. And she saved your life? Yes, she saved my life. Me, the guy who could wreck everything she has. Dave, I know how you feel. I don't think you do. All right, maybe I don't. I'm just a cop. But there's one thing I do know. That girl in there is wanted on suspicion, and no matter what you say, you can't change that. Well, I'm not taking her in. 
You're not going to take her in. What do you have to say about it? What did you do while you were up here? Rewrite the criminal code? Doris Hepburn is not a criminal. Oh, Dave Robinson says she's not a criminal, so she's not. Just like that. Case dismissed, huh? Oh, come on, Dave. You're a cop, remember? This isn't a personal matter between you and Doris Hepburn. Her crime's against the state, the community, the law, the I way... I know the words. You should. You taught them to me. You decided to move into the DA's office? I have. Well, what are you going to do when you move in there if you don't take the girl in now? Make up the rules as you go along? Well, why not, if they're good rules? Ah, Dave. Steve, no correctional institution could improve on what Doris Hepburn has done for herself. Whether she's guilty or not, she's paid for it. Waiting two years to be discovered. Waiting for someone to tap her on the shoulder and say, I arrest you in the name of the law. What law? Law that says you gotta lock her up until she can return to society as a good citizen? That's the book. Well, then show me a better citizen than Doris Hepburn. Oh, Steve, I, I, I'm not talking about changing any laws. Well, what are you talking about? Well, I'm just trying to say the law cannot be black or white. It wouldn't work that way. There's got to be room for understanding, tolerance, compassion, forgiveness. But that's not up to you. Well, who says the rules can't be changed? The book. Well, there's another book with some pretty good rules, ten of them. Dave, we can't be concerned with moral considerations. Well, if we can't, we're lousy cops. Now, I'm going to go inside and pack. You make up your own mind. Goodbye, Mr. and Mrs. Hepburn. I'm sorry my visit was such a short one, but I'd sure like to come back again and stay for a while. You'll be welcome any time. Manny, I got a little unfinished business with you. I never did complete your mother's fortune. That's right, you didn't. Well, here it is, Manny. I see nothing but happiness ahead for your mommy. Nothing to worry about. Nothing but a bright, shining future with a wonderful man for a husband and a couple of wonderful boys. Why are you crying, Mommy? That's a wonderful fortune. <sighs> These are happy tears, Manny. Very happy tears. Well, goodbye, everybody. Hope to see you real soon. Goodbye, Dave. Thanks. Bye, Dave. Doc, bye, Dave. Best patient I ever had. Steve, you're a better cop than I thought you were. Gonna buy you dinner on the way in. Might even buy you a drink. No. I'll buy you one.
Charles Boyer, David Niven, Frank Lovejoy, Brought to you by your neighborhood Singer Sewing Centers from coast to coast and the more than 32,000 members of the Singer Organization who make, sell, and service Singer Sewing Machines for both industry and the home. Remember, Singer sells its products and services only through the Singer Sewing Centers identified by the famous Red S trademark on the window. George, better get some sleep. mind about my sleep. I'm sure you haven't had any in the last 48 hours. No, we got a great game going now. I ask about you, you answer about me. What's it called? Love. <laughs> After all these years. Hey, Dad, there's a swell picture of you on the front page. Yeah, with your name and everything. Is that guy a shot gonna die? No. Daddy shot a bad man. Oh, a bad man. He was 10 years older than Freddie. You want to see the picture, Dad? No. When you boys get through with the sports page. No, Harry. Dan, I... Oh, it wasn't as bad as the newspaper boys set it up. We just bumped into the holdup. We were cruising around looking for trouble. And you found it. Or it found you. Oh, you know I never read the newspapers or listen to the radio till you get home. You need a big breakfast. How many eggs? One. New diet. One egg. One hunk of toast, one cup of coffee, one lump of sugar. Live to be 100. You probably will. Well, anyway, that's what Doc Jones said. Put this away for me, will you, dear? Let it alone. I'm reading it. Let the oh, doctor come on there now. The <laughs> Freddie, if you ever push Daddy like that again, I'll take a broomstick to you. And I'm not just talking. Well, but tell him not to grab the paper. I only like the funny. Okay, you've got half of them. Well, Let give him the that. other half. Boys, your father would like a little quiet. Not much, baby, just a little, huh? Hey, I'm reading it. Listen, oh, the train is going to the desolate. Now, come on, you're making a nervous wreck out of your mother. Uh, oh, there's nothing wrong with you, Dad. I'm just no, tired. I'm to... Morning, Mr. Hodges. Mrs. Hodges. Oh, this will cost you six cents. Six cents? Hmm. It's worth it. Seems like they keep these posters do things over till Saturday. <laughs> Time for a cup of coffee? Well, I really shouldn't, uh, but... Uh, Boys, please. I'm afraid not. If you boys can't stay out of the way, I'll have to ask you to leave. Here, I give up. I can't fix it. You let me show you. Why don't you and Johnny go outside and soak up some sun? In a minute. Hi, Bill. Hi. Hey, a lot of excitement last night, huh? Mm hmm. Just like in the movies. Yeah, I should have been on the force. Action. I always wanted action. Some action. A milk jockey. I'll trade you straight up right now. I believe you would. Try me. Oh, now, who can that be? I'll answer it. I'll have the brown eggs for you next week, Mrs. Hodges. So long, Bill. So long. It's Mr. Harvey. The lights were on all night at the Harveys. They were probably arguing. He's been... Drinking again? For days. Thanks. Morning, everybody. Oh, Frank, sit down. Sit down. Okay. Good old Dan. How do you feel? Great. Just great. You don't happen to have a drink around here, do you? 
Sure. Stella, some black coffee for Frank. Maybe you're right. Anyway, you've got a manner about you that I like. Some people have a way of saying things. You know how to say things. It comes out right. Now, my wife, she... Yes. My wife, one of these days, we're going to kill each other. Every day, it's a new argument. Or is it the same one? I don't know. Thanks, Stella. I thought maybe Dorothy was over here. She's not here, Frank. I see. She flounced out this morning and flew away. I don't know where. Maybe if you were nicer to All her, All right, she... uh, Stella. Freddie, it's a great day to practice forward passing. Oh, Dad. Now, come on, no speeches, no arguments. Just take off. You'll never win the Rose Bowl of 1963 in here. Come back tomorrow, Johnny. The paper will be even bigger. Okay, we're men from Mars. Let's invade. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I'm a soldier, too. I'm going to shoot you. Bang, bang, bang. bang. you got to pull yourself together, Frank. Too late. Here, put it right over here, Willie. Wait till I move these. There you go. Wait till I check it. It's all there. I didn't take anything. You got lucky last night, huh, Copper? Willie, I'd hope you'd learn some manners at that juvenile home. Maybe I was too sharp for him up there. Good morning. Uh, I was just looking at your lawn, and I thought I might interest you in a power lawnmower. I'm sorry we have one. That's the trouble everyone has. You know, I'm finding out everybody has practically everything. Well, thanks, anyway. Wait a minute. Isn't your lawnmower better? Why? Well, you give up so easily. What kind of a salesman are you? A lousy one. You know, I'm finding out this working for an honest living is strictly for the birds. It's the only guy I'll live and work for. Yeah, you get an argument for me on that point. You'd lose. I'm a cop. My card. Lun, huh? Well, we'll call you if we need one. I'll get it, Stella. No. What am I supposed to do? Keep waiting? You're supposed to keep waiting. It's Saturday. I got quite a night ahead, you know. Big deal, huh? The biggest. Dan, it's the department. They need some information. Thanks, dear. List is okay, Willie. I told you it was. Hello? Yes, I turned the report in on those two fellows to homicide. That's right. No? Yeah. That's their baby now. Okay, good. No, 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 bother at all. Mark. Where's Frank? Oh, I don't know. He just up and walked out. Oh, honestly, Dan, I don't blame him. This place has been like 7th and Broadway all morning. People in and out and kids, doorbells, telephones. I have... Dan, I'm exhausted. You must be, too. Stella, Stella, this isn't like you, honey. Is there something worrying you? I'll worry about you. I'll fix your eggs and, and get you to bed. One egg, remember? I'm on a diet. All right. I'll see if I can keep the place quiet. Stella, my gun, did you put it away? No, Dan, I, I put your holster over the chair, but... Dear, I have the holster, but the gun isn't in it. Oh, well, well, Dan, I put it... How many times have I told you a loaded gun you put away up high? It was loaded. Six big ones. Well, Dan, who could have taken it? Well, I... anybody could have taken it. The whole town's been in here this morning. Willie, the postman... Frank.
Frank, the gun, where is it? Where is it? What's going on here? That's what I want to know. What did Dorothy tell you to make you act like a crazy man? You gotta tell me where you got the gun? No. I ain't gonna tell you nothing. You ain't on my side. Where's Dorothy? Frank, why do you do this to me? I'm your good friend. I've always been your good friend. I'm sorry, Dan. But what happened to your nice man? I know I'm not much good around. Where have you got the gun? It's locked in the bedroom. You haven't had time to go in there. Well, that's where it is. Then you're lying to I'm me. not lying. Since when is it a crime for a man to have a hunting gun? It ain't even loaded or nothing. You want me to show it to you? Well, don't you want to see the gun? Bill! Bill, hold, hold, hold. hold it, Bill. Hey, what gives? You wanted action, maybe I can give you some. My gun disappeared. Well, you don't think I took it now, do you? No, I don't. Did you? Well, what would I be doing? Did you? Well, no. Where did it disappear from? The kitchen just now. Well, who was in the kitchen? The kids, Freddie, Willie, Jim, the postman. Some guy selling lawnmowers made a crack about being sick of making an honest living. Well, that don't mean nothing. Bill, this morning, everything means something. Did you see which way the kids took off? Well, probably the ball field. What was the last thing they talked about? Mars. I gotta find the kids. Well, jump in. I'm almost through anyway. Come on. Hey, Jim. Have you seen my son, Freddy, and his pals? Uh -uh. Somebody took my gun out of the holster. It's loaded. What would kids do a thing like that for? Well, why do kids do any of the crazy things they do? I'm not sure they took the gun, but somebody did. I saw Willie the grocery boy heading in the old place. I'll bet he took it. He's a pretty bad character. No, I don't think Willie took the gun. Why not? I don't know. I just don't think so. Even I. I could have taken it. Even you, Jim. What would I want with a gun? What does anybody want with a gun unless he's a policeman? Thanks, Jim. Bill, there's no reason for both of us to travel in the same direction. Won't you try the schoolhouse? Right. Count me in, too. Good. You check the ballpark, and I'll head for the business district. Okay. Dan. Dan. Oh, hello, Doctor. I I'm in a bit of a hurry. I just wanted to tell you some very good news, Dan. Yes, sir. Uh, what's that, Doctor? Stella's all right. Stella? I don't understand. Oh, there's nothing to worry about. The report came through this morning. Nothing serious at all. You mean Stella's been ill, been to see you? I thought that you knew. She told me nothing. I don't like that. Oh, I suppose I should have guessed it. She's been looking tired and worried lately. What was the trouble? We'll let her tell you, now that there's nothing to worry about at all. Frankly, it was Stella's mental attitude that caused me more concern than anything else. She was terribly distressed, morose, despondent. I know people say things in a moment of anguish that they don't mean at all. But still, Stella's an intelligent girl. What did she say? Perhaps we'd better not talk about it, now that it's turned out well. But Stella doesn't know that yet. What did she say? She was terribly depressed. It worried me when she talked of, well, doing away with herself. Doing away? But well, Dan, Dan! Danny, where's your mother? Locked up. Locked up where? And then she closed the door. What are you looking for? The gun. In here? Stella, I 
I just saw Doc Jones on the street. He told me something that led me to believe. Yeah. What did he say? He says, you're all right. Your report came back fine. Oh, oh Dan, I didn't want you to know. Are you telling me the truth? Of course I am. Darling, no one can go it alone in this world. Why do you try? You had enough on your mind. I have you on my mind always. Oh, Dan, I... I was so frightened. I was at my wit's end. I, I didn't know where to turn. Dear, if I ever lost you, I'd travel the rest of my years like a man in a bad dream. Now, promise me something. No more secrets between us. Promise me that. Oh, I... I do promise, darling. Now, you just lie there and rest. I've got work to do. Did you see Frank? Yes. He hasn't got it. Mr. Hodges? Mr. Hodges? Mr. Hodges, Freddie has heard something awful. What happened? I don't know. He's bleeding terrible. That's all I know. I was told to run and get you. Well, was there a gun? Huh? Was there a gun? Oh, yeah, lots of them. Cat pistols. Oh, Dan, let's go. Oh, dear, you stay here. Oh, but Dan... Stay here. Maybe it's... I'll call you. Alan cut his arm, Mr. Hodges. But he'll be okay. No artery cut. Lost a little blood, but he'll be okay. Hurt much, Freddie? No, it, it's okay, Dad. Look, boys, somebody took my gun. Do you know anything about it? No, Mr. Hodges. You boys didn't take it? Mm -mm, we wouldn't do anything like that. I'll take him over to Dr. Jones. Would you do that for me? Sure. Freddie, you go along with Charlie now. <coughs> I, uh, tell Dr. Jones I'll be there as soon as I can. Come on, son. Finish looking? Yeah. Go find your gun yourself. Oh, Bill, be reasonable. Will you? I'm half out of my mind. You're all out of your mind. Looking for a gun in my milk truck? Falling you like a ton of steel. I don't know what you're talking about. What did I do? Inside. You lousy cop. Willie, I never laid hands on anybody except to fight for my life. Now I'm fighting for somebody else's. When you hand over that gun, and you're going to, you won't go back to the reform school. I'm going to see that you make the big time. I haven't got any gun. Big Saturday night deal. Who are you going to heist? I don't know what you're talking about. You know, I had you figured as being too smart to do such a stupid thing as grab a cop's gun. But you're not smart. You got gas chamber written all over you. You've got to make it. But not on my time. Now, where is it? Where'd you stash it? I haven't got it. Stop lying to me. I haven't got it. Please believe me, copper. Just because I did time once, you think of all the time I haven't got it. Why didn't you leave me alone? Why didn't you ask your own kids? Leave me alone. I didn't do anything. All right, Willie. You've got a reprieve, but you better be telling me the truth. I am telling the truth. 
Hello, Stella. I saw Freddy. He's all right. He doesn't have the gun. I know. You what? Little Danny has it. Must have hidden it in the kitchen somewhere. He won't give it to me. Somehow he's... He's got the hammer back. Guns cocked. What can I do? I don't want him to get hurt, Dan. Dan, where are you? I'm afraid to make a move. Don't. Dan. Dan, he's... He's pointing at... Stella. Stella! Little Danny's got the gun. You lousy cop! Willie, I'm sorry. I'll make it up to you. I don't know how, but I promise I'll make it up to you. You lousy cop! You lousy cop! gun back on the table. No. Don't fall. Stop. 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 Dad, I must have. That's all right. A little dead. That's all right. Here, come on. Sit here. Did I? Here, drink this. Stella, Danny still has the gun. He's somewhere in the front of the house. For the first chance I get, Dad. I'm... He's standing in the doorway. Don't look at him. Smile at me. Come on, smile. Just pretend you aren't interested in what he's doing. He's gone. Oh, Dan, can't we just go and take the gun from him? No, no, we can't, Dan. Now, listen, he's playing games. The loaded gun. Dan, it's all my fault. Oh, it's no one's fault, dear. Stella, don't give way, please. Listen to me. Do you feel like walking? I'm all right. I want you to walk out the door, down the driveway, and get in the car. It's parked in front. But, Dan... If little Danny sees you getting in the car, he'll think you're going shopping. And you know what a big deal that is with him. Maybe he'll forget what he's doing and run after you. Oh, but, Dan, I can't Stella, leave you here. Stella, please. Please, Stella. Go, will you, please? Oh, Mommy! Don't forget to get a lot of ice cream and some of those nice cookies. Seen Daddy's cigarettes, Danny? They're in the kitchen, Daddy. You want to get them for Daddy? No. Daddy will get them himself. Mommy's going shopping. Dan! Shut the duck's head off. Oh. It's all right now, it's all right. Oh, Daddy will buy you a new duck. Yes, right now. We'll all go oh, out. Oh, you need sleep, Dan. Who needs to sleep? All I want to do is just walk around in the sunshine and think of nothing except you. Oh, I love you, Dan Hodges. Do you love me? 
course we do, Danny, of course we yeah. do. We present Dick Powell in A Spray of Bullets. Good afternoon, Phineas. Hey, Tom. Well, you all set for the rodeo this afternoon at Morgan's? <laughs> Took a heap more in the rodeo to get me a half mile out of town. Nope, I'm going to sit right here. <laughs> You'd be about the only man left in town. There'll be a big crowd there. Well, don't get too lonesome. <laughs> I never do. Phineas. Yeah. I seen him in Kingston once when he was sheriff. Howdy, Mr. Charlotte. Hi. Phineas, you better go get the sheriff. What for? Ain't no crime for a man coming into town, is there? Will Sonnet ain't sheriff no more. Besides, you know who's in that saloon? Ben Crane. Now go get Sam and tell him to keep his eyes wide open. The sheriff is out at Morgan's. Besides, I wouldn't tell him no how. And we're liable to see some real excitement with Crane and Sonnet in town. Well, I'll go tell him myself. Maybe you'd like to see trouble if the sheriff won't. Come on. Ah, sure. Sorry to keep you waiting, sir. I was just having something to eat. Come to Mason for the rodeo this afternoon? No. Oh? Should be checking out in the morning. We're gonna get a bath. We have a tub right here in the hotel. Would you like to reserve it? Of course, there's an extra charge of 50 cents for the boy to bring up hot water. I want it right away. All right, I'll take care of that, sir. And I do hope you're gonna enjoy your stay with us, Mr. Uh... Sonnet? That's right. Now, if there's anything I can do for you, I mean, anything at all, any, anything that, that you'd... Let's start with the key. Huh? The key. Oh, yes, of course. That's, uh, room nine, sir. Thank you. inside. I tried the office. No, he's gone out to Morgan to see if everything's ready for the rodeo this afternoon. I'm sure you can find him there. That's a fine thing. One time we need a lawman and Sam's out of town. That's 
drugs. Nothing yet. But Mace has got a visitor. A visitor whose gun is slung low and knows how to use it. A gunman in Mesa? And one thing's sure. Will Sonnet don't just travel around for the fun of it. Will Sonnet? Sonnet, Herb, Hickok, don't make no difference. Wherever that kind is, there's bound to be gunplay. And it's your Pa's job to protect us citizens. Where is he? Checked in the hotel. Why? Mind my rushing here? I know I'm meeting you more than halfway. No, no, I'm glad you did. Have I changed much in a year? Well, if anything, you're prettier. <laughs> it's good to see you, Lucy. Oh, I know. When Dad and I left Kingston, I was mad. I was so mad, I thought I never wanted to see you again. You told me, remember? I'm so glad you've come. Glad you've changed. Is that why you think I came, Lucy? Because I've changed? Well, isn't it? Lucy. Nothing could make me happier than seeing you, but I have to be honest with you. I didn't know until you walked in the door that you were even in Mesa. I see. But it shouldn't make any difference, really. I, I, I'm grateful to see you, very grateful. Well, I'm afraid it makes a great deal of difference, Will. I come rushing in here and throw myself into your arms and tell you how glad I am you came for me. You hadn't come for me at all. Lucy, Lucy. What did you come for, Will? Well, I... I have some business to take care of. Guess I made quite a fool of myself, didn't I? No, no. Will, I told you a long time ago that if you ever willing to quit wearing a gun, I'd be waiting for you. But you haven't changed. You're the same man, and you've even got the same gun. Don't worry. I won't interfere with your business. Sonnet, my name is uh, Phineas, Phineas Turner. I seen you when you gunned down Rich Long in Tucson four years ago. Fastest draw I ever seen, faster than lightning. We'll talk about it some other time, huh? Yeah, sure, sure. You got business now, right? That's right, yeah. He's in the saloon. Oh, you don't have to worry about me. I ain't gonna interfere. I'm afraid you lost me, old timer. Look. You can level with me, Will. I know that you got to play at Cagey, but you got nothing to worry about. The sheriff is out of town, and you got plenty of time. Plenty of time for what? Ben Crane. What about Crane? Well, Crane came into town just about an hour before you did. Took his horse over at the blacksmith shop, said he's got to stay around until his horse is reshot. So? So, I believed him. Until I see you come riding in, then things add up. Tough gunman Ben Crane, just happens in town. And then, Will Sant comes mosey in here. Shucks, <laughs> that's just like putting a wolf and a wildcat in the same stall. You got a great imagination. You mean to tell me you didn't come to town to meet Ben? We've met before. Sorry to disappoint you. Hey, Sonnet. Will Sonnet in a hick town like this. Strange world. Yeah, sure is, Ben. You just passing through town, Will? Maybe. How's about yourself? Maybe. I ain't seen you in a long time, but I heard about you giving up your sheriff's job over in Kingston. Oh, you did? Yeah. Darn if I'll ever forget the time you locked me up on a drunk charge. Remember? You didn't think you were so funny at the time. Well, that was a couple of years ago. A man changes. Take a gunman. He can get a lot faster in a couple of years. I guess he can. Practice makes perfect. I wouldn't say it was exactly perfect, but I have been getting a lot of practice. So I hear. Funny us running into each other like this. I was a little clumsy with a six-shooter back in my Kingston days. Think you're any better now? I'm not sure, Will. Uh, it pays to be sure. Stakes pretty high if you lose. You know, I reckon I'd rather have your reputation than anyone else's. You've got a good bluff and you're fast enough to back it up. Reputation doesn't mean much. 
a matter of opinion. Some people kill for a reputation. Take you. If I was to kill you, people would call me a big man. Is that what you want to be? Like you said, it pays to be sure. And I ain't exactly sure if I'm fast enough. Yet. Care for a drink? No, thanks. Maybe some other time, Will. Maybe. Oh, Mr. Charlotte, just a minute. I want you to meet our sheriff. Howdy. Is that any way to greet an old friend? Sam! The old son of a gun. The sun was in my eyes. I couldn't see you. Fine way to treat your old deputy. I'm glad to see you. Talked to Lucy a little earlier. She didn't say anything about you being sheriff here. I'm surprised she'd let you take this kind of a job. Well, it's a pretty quiet town. That is, when there ain't men like you around. I heard you give up the badge in Kingston last month. Yeah. Been wondering when you'd come back for Lucy. Always figure you two could make a go of it. Well, that, uh, that isn't why I came here. Oh? No, I came here... I have a little business here. I see. Will, I hope you won't cause any trouble. I didn't come here for that. There won't be any trouble unless someone else starts it. Like to talk? Maybe later. You'll be through with my business about a half an hour. All right. My office is down the street. I'll be waiting for you. Fine. Dr. Sanders. I wonder what's ailing him. He ain't that kind of a doc. He's an arc uh, something an eye doctor. An eye doctor? Why do you figure a fella like Sonnet travels all this way just to see an eye doctor? Kind of funny, ain't it? Yeah, mighty funny. Here he comes, Ben. Appears like he's heading for the sheriff's office. Are you sure that doc he went to see is an eye doctor? Of course I'm sure. Sam? Finish your business? Just about. I'll be all set by tomorrow morning. Just what are you doing here in Mesa, Will? You asking as a friend? I'm asking as a sheriff. That's what I'm paid to be. Folks get edgy when a man with your reputation comes to a town like this. They want to know why. They want to know if there's going to be trouble. So, my job is to find out. I see. You didn't come here to meet Ben Crane, did you, Will? No, no. Ben and I met by accident. He's a pretty fast boy. Ben's fast, but he couldn't outdraw you. Look, Sam, I told you I didn't want any trouble. I could whip Ben easy, up close. What do you mean, up close? Well, that has to do with the real reason I came to Mesa. Now, if I'm through talking to the sheriff, I'll be glad to tell my friend why I'm here. Start talking, friend. You know something, old man? I feel like I'm getting a case of eye strain. I think maybe I better go up and see that doc. Yes, sir. I understand you're an eye doctor, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Are you working on something now? Well, it's a pair of spectacles for a new patient. Uh, how long does it take to make up a pair? Well, these will be finished by tomorrow morning. But uh, if you're in a big hurry, suppose we run a test, see just what's wrong. Sure, why not? Well, all right, sit right down here. Funny how I found out about you. I just run into my old friend, Will Sonnet. We got to talking, he told me about you. Oh. It uh, seems like Will and I both got about the same ailment. Oh, you mean everything over 20 yards is all blurred? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's a pretty miserable thing to happen to a man. So that's why you quit as sheriff, hmm? What else could I do? First, I thought it was sun blindness. I'd been trailing a man out in the desert. 
Then when the blurring didn't go away, I got scared. I thought I was going blind. Good thing you heard about the doc here. Yeah, he's kind of hard to find, West. Travel around a lot. So your eyes have been bad for over two months, eh? Yeah. What about an old Thorpe? What about him? We heard you had a fight with him just two weeks ago in Silver City. You gunned him down from a distance of about 30 yards. Luck. Nothing but luck. Tharp had a big mouth. I judged his position by the sound of his voice. Fanned my gun, set a spray of bullets, and one of them hit him. That's not the kind of luck I want to push. I think not. Will, did you tell Lucy about this? No. Why not? Now, when I saw Lucy this morning, I didn't know where I stood. She still loves you. That's not what I mean. I didn't know what was happening to my eyes. Maybe in a few weeks or months, I'd go stone blind. I just didn't want to burden Lucy with that. Lucy's no baby. Chances are you're being too considerate. Mm, I don't think so. Anyway, there's nothing seriously wrong. Doc tells me I'll be all right. I want to talk to Lucy now. You know where she is? Well, she hasn't brought my lunch yet, but she's probably on her way out the rodeo. I have to be there, too, so how about riding along? Why not? I'll get my horse and be right back. drink now, Will. I'm still not thirsty. That's too bad. We have the whole bar to ourselves. Seems like everyone's gone to the rodeo. Do you like rodeos? Yeah, if they're good ones. Yeah, me too. You see some nice stock at rodeos these days. Some nice horse flesh, too. Like that pinto over there. Yeah, nice horse. Sure is. You're going to be in town long, Will? I'll be around. So will I. Maybe we can have that drink later. Maybe. What's the matter with you two fellas? You crazy? Why? That ain't no pinto over there. That's Jim Lewis' stallion. No kidding. After all, she's inside and wants to talk to you. I'll go over to the house and eat. If you still want to go to the rodeo, stop by. Lucy? Dad told me about your eyes. There's a question I'd like to ask you. I think I know what it is. When I get my eyes fixed up, am I going to go back to being sheriff? Mm-hmm. It's been a bad year for me, Lucy. I never thought I'd miss you the way I did. It was a wasted year. For you, too? Yes, Will. Well, then I guess there's only one way for me to answer your question. Tomorrow, my eyes won't be a problem anymore, and I could get my job back. But I won't. I'll find something else. I'm so glad. Do you understand now? I love you so much, I just couldn't stand your being a sheriff. Never knowing when you might be brought home hurt or, or dead. My dad's been a lawman all his life. I've seen what it's done to him and the mother. Always worrying. And... I know, I know. How do you like your husband wearing glasses? Well, I like it fine. As long as he's not wearing a gun belt. But you won't even let me hunt rabbits. Go tell Dad. Yeah, we better tell him everything's all right. He'll be worried about me knowing your temper. Sonic! Who's that? 
Sounds like Ben Crane. What does he look like? Oh, he's wearing a dark hat, green shirt. Tall. Is he a friend of yours? No friend. Sonnet! You better send your girlfriend back inside. That's Ben Crane, all right. What does he mean? I changed my mind. I think I'm fast enough now. Maybe I'd like to be a big man. Get back inside, Lizzie. No. Do as I say. But, well, you can't even see him. Get back in there. That's better. I never figured you to be one to hide behind a woman's skirts. You've been drinking, Ben. You wouldn't make this play earlier. No, I'm sober, Will. I never pick a fight when I'm drunk. I don't see too good when I'm drinking, and you gotta see good to fight, ain't that right? It's a fool play, but if you want it, let's make it close. Sure, Will, come on. There's about 60 paces between us, and that's no distance to fight. You want it closer? Come on, Will, I'm waiting. Yards, that's better. Keep coming. About thirty now, Will. That's a good distance. Hold it, Will. Thirty yards is just fine by me, Will. Of course, you might like it closer. Say twenty? But I'm calling this play. The old man here has been itching to see us tangle all day. Suppose we let him in on it. Start counting to five, old man. When he reaches five, you make your place on it. Sheriff, you should have seen it. I figured that the first shot got him. Ben never even shot once. I've never seen anything like it before. Where was Lucy when it happened, Phineas? In there? Yeah. That's what I figured. Why the rifle, Okay. No 45 slug makes the hole the size of the one in Crane. No? I taught Lucy how to shoot when she was a little girl. Looks like she didn't forget. Will said he was lucky. He sure is. 
She's getting quite a girl, Phineas. Quite a girl. Star Playhouse presents Dick Powell, Charles Boyer, David Niven, Frank Lovejoy. Brought to you by your neighborhood Singer Sewing Centers from coast to coast and the more than 32,000 members of the Singer Organization who make, sell, and service Singer Sewing Machines for both industry and the home. Remember, Singer sells its products and services only through the Singer Sewing Centers, identified by the famous Red S trademark on the window. Tonight on Four Star Playhouse, Singer presents Dick Powell in The Witness. Michael Donegan. He didn't show up again. It's the fourth straight day and the judge is fit to be tied. Uh, Donegan's client hasn't got a chance, so he's stalling. I don't know what that'll get him except a contempt citation. Well, I'll call the city desk if there's any changes. Now, this court is not a gymnasium for the acrobatics of Michael Donegan nor the city of New York, an instrument upon which he can practice his own brand of courtroom tactics. Where is he, Mr. Bedeker? Uh, if your honor, please. Where is he, Mr. Bedeker? Why isn't he here? Well, Mr. Donegan is desperately trying to locate the key witness for the defense. In the interest of justice, your honor. Your but... honor, Mr. Donegan's been desperately trying for the past four days to locate that witness. I submit this farce has gone far enough. This is another of Donegan's tricks to delay trial. It's a clear case of contempt. I'll handle this, Mr. District Attorney. Mr. Bedeker. Yes, sir. I will recess until tomorrow morning. But trial will proceed at that time whether or not Mr. Donegan is present. Well, Your Honor, Mr. Donegan prepared the defense. No one else is equipped. Then he'd better be here, eh, Mr. Bedeker? Mr. Donegan may be busy somewhere else today. But tomorrow, he's going to be busy in this courtroom. Oh, I'll have a T-bone steak rare on the inside, charred on the outside. What's the matter? Mr. Donegan, don't you got an imagination? Steak. What a time, steak. Look, I'm going to give you a break. I'm going to bring you out a nice plate of Greek lamb divetsi. I made with my little hands. Well, that's the main reason I want a T-bone steak and some O'Brien potato. OK, he's got a stomach. Oh, be our guest. Hello, Mr. Donegan. Hi, fellow. Had your lunch? Yes, sir. Okay. Right, you have a cup of coffee and a slice of mixed apple pie. Oh, apple pie. I'll have some myself, too. Hmm? Two apple pie. How'd it go, fellow? Mr. Donegan, I can't begin to describe how angry the judge was. Try the oblique approach? Yes, sir. I, I thought he was going to have a stroke. Hmm. Well, that's oblique enough. Mr. Donegan, what are we going to do? Philip, now you're doing wonderfully. You know, someday I expect to see the name Philip Bedeker III in gold letters on our door. Well, that's very gratifying, sir. But tomorrow... Tomorrow? 
tomorrow and tomorrow, we're going to keep on getting delays. Yes, but... Fill up, we're protecting our client, aren't we? Yes, sir, I know he doesn't stand a chance unless we find this Alice Blair. And we've got to have time to find her. But we're not finding her. We're no closer to finding her than we were three weeks ago. Mr. Donegan, what are we going to do tomorrow morning? Oh, right at the moment, Philip. I haven't got the slightest idea. Aren't you going to wait for your apple pie? Uh, no, sir, I, I've got a touch of heartburn. But I ordered it. Oh, Edith. Yeah. Hey, Philip, I saw your act in court this morning. You're uh, improving with experience. Oh, Mr. Peterson, I'll be at the office if you want me. All right, Philip. Pete? I said you wanted to see me, Mike. It's not much of a place for business, but I know you're pretty busy. Mm. Well, I got your bill. Outrageous, isn't it? I am sorry about it, though, Mike, but it costs a lot of money to have six top operators moving around. You know that. Because the price is the result. Yeah, there aren't any. You know, Mike, if anybody but you asked me to make this search, I'd say they're out of their minds. Nothing. Nothing that hasn't led us up a blind alley. Like what? Well, like one of the boys got onto a girl that he thinks might have known a girl by the name of Alice. Let's see. 5'3", 114 pounds, blonde. She's a model. But that's all we know about her, except that she's been dining here at Nick's almost every day lately. Well, she isn't here now. My, well, you've changed. Blonde, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, Alice is a brunette. If there is an Alice Blair, this one might have been her roommate. What do you think, Pete? I think you're wasting your money with me. You got us chasing the phantom. There isn't any Alice Blair. Mm. Well, my client says it. I don't care what your client says. I still think she doesn't exist outside his imagination. No Alice Blair ever handed over any 6,500 bucks to him. Well, it looks as if I'll have to have a little heart-to-heart -heart talk with my client. What's wrong, Mr. Donegan? Well, you lied to me. For three weeks, I've had six detectives combing this whole town for that mythical woman of yours. Well, she's a brunette with blue eyes, the kind of figure you could... Yeah, 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 I know. What did you do with the money, Frank? I told you. Well, she didn't give it to you. You pulled that payroll robbery and shot the guard yourself. But she did give it to me. She gave it to me the first night I met her. Oh, that's something you didn't tell me. It's because I didn't think you'd believe me. A woman you meet the first night gives you $6,500. Well, you see, we went to my apartment and we played cards. Oh, well, that explains everything. You know how it is when, you know how it is when you play for fun? You, you make up all kinds of stakes. Well, when she pulled out all these new 10s and 20s, Mr. Donegan, I didn't want to touch that money. She asked me to hold on to it for, for a while anyway, for safekeeping, she says. Uh, you couldn't make up a story like that. And then, well, I kept it around the apartment for a while, and I got kind of worried about all that money laying around, so I took it down to the bank. you know how much money was in that payroll? I, I think the paper said 150000 mm. Over. What do you think happened to the rest of the money? I don't know. Honest, I, I don't know. You really don't? You know what I think? I think Alice Blair is working with a fellow who pulled the robbery. I think they gave you the money to see if it was hot. See if you could pass it. If you tried to pass it and got caught, you'd burn for it. If it wasn't hot, well, Alice and this guy would be safe for the rest of the payroll. No, Mr. Donegan, Alice isn't like that. She's the most wonderful girl I've ever known. She's considerate, gentle, and sweet. She's the kind of a girl that makes you think you're the, the biggest and best man in the world. Oh, now I know you made her up. Who ever heard of a woman like that? All I know is if you find her, I know she'll tell the truth. Well, all I know is that if I don't, it's my reputation and your life. This is a murder charge. Oh, well, we'll think of something. Hey, guard! Get me out of this fire trap. Yeah, that's right. Looks like another delay. Donegan didn't show up again. This will make the fifth day in a row. Hey, Marty, I gotta go. Court's in session. Yeah, I'll call you back. No, oh, Philip. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, Philip, I think you're doing brilliantly. Uh-huh. No, I'm not coming back to the office this afternoon. 
But for many reasons. One of which is I'm having a tea with a lovely lady. Is that all, Philip? Oh, yes, I am quite busy. Mm -hmm. oh, goodbye, Philip. But you'd never get back. Oh, to Gibson's, do you mind? Wonderful. And thank you, Michael. For what, the Gibson's? No, for calling me a lovely lady. <laughs> well, I was always taught in law school that the defendant is innocent until proved guilty. <laughs> I'm afraid even you would have trouble proving me innocent. The one last night was pretty, huh? Take the phone. Take the phone. To the rest of the day. All the things for you, I wish for myself. Oh, Michael. It's so elegant. Smart. What's more, it's comfy. Try this chair. It's very comfortable. Drink? Love one. Music? Why not? If you give this key, I've got an alcoholic butler. <laughs> what an exciting world you live in. Well, it has its moments. Now? Now is one of the moments. Thank you. You know, that's been a very relaxing day. For me too, Michael. Strange too. It seems like I've known you a long, long time. That's your own calmness inside. Your confidence. Must be a great comfort to your clients. Well, it isn't very comforting to the client I'm representing right now. The, um, oh, the Frank Dana case. Yes. But you're so clever about these things, Mike. You'll win the case. You always do. If I find Alice Blair. If I find her, I win. If I don't, I lose. Then my client loses, too. Let me do it, Michael. Go on. Relax. Don't mind if I do, but I'm on my feet all day. You're being very gentle with me. Introducing yourself to me, taking me to dinner. Why, Michael? Because you wanted me to. You wanted to find out all you could about Frank Dana. How did you know, Michael? Well, the one crumb of evidence I got from six detectives working three weeks was that you might be a friend of Alice Blair. I see. I guess I'm just lucky. The delays I've been getting in the trial are coming to an end. Now you come along. I'm just lucky. I wish I could help, Michael. You're the only one who can. And if you don't, an innocent man will go to the chair. No, you won't let him, Mike. You'll figure a way. Michael, Ellis Blair can't get involved. If I like you like this, very nice, charming, gracious, how did Frank Dana put it? He said she's the kind of girl who will make you think you're the biggest and best man in the world. Considerate, gentle. I can't imagine you looking any better as a brunette with those blue eyes. Mike. He's in trouble, Alice. Mike, I can't tell you why, but I just can't. Why did you give him the money? No. I understand you're a pretty bad card player. It was just a way. I wanted Frank to put it in a safe place. It wasn't very safe. All right. What do I have to do, Mike? Tell the jury you gave him the money. That's all? Not where I got it? He's on trial. You're not. All right, Mike. Thank you, Alice. Say, see this sewing machine needle so busy at work? Well, keep your eye on it, for it's going to take you to a really exciting offer. This is the needle of a Singer sewing machine, whose name and reputation you've known all your life. And this particular Singer machine is one of the most famous models that famous Singer makes, the Singer Round Bobbin Economy Model. It comes as both a gorgeous cabinet machine and in a portable style, complete with handsome carrying case. Now, here's that offer. The down payment on the Singer Economy Portable is just $10.95, yes, $10.95, with liberal trade-in on your old machine and easy budget terms for the rest. Or if you prefer this handsome walnut cabinet, the down payment is only $14.95, with the same liberal trade-in allowance and easy budget terms. 
In addition, with either style you choose, you'll receive, at no extra charge, the famous Singer Sewing Course, a series of step-by-step instruction from Singer-trained experts. Now, let's look at some of the exciting new features of this Singer Round Bobbin Economy model. There's the new bobbin winder that stops automatically when the bobbin is full. The new numbered tension control that makes tension adjustments so much faster and simpler. The new hinged presser foot that goes over heavy materials as easily and smoothly as fine fabrics. And this machine lets you finish off your sewing with a neat back tack stitch. Remember, the Singer Economy model in this beautiful walnut cabinet is only $149.95 with a down payment of only $14.95. And the same machine in handy portable style is only $114.95 with a down payment of just $10.95. And with either model, you'll receive the famous Singer sewing course absolutely free. So try one of these Singers in your home soon. There's no charge, no obligation of any kind. Just phone or stop in at your Singer sewing center tomorrow and ask for your free home trial. With a handkerchief masking his face, stole a payroll in excess of $150,000, and with deliberate intent, did shoot Harold Toomey, one of the two guards, to death with the same gun. The state will prove that Frank Dana attempted to pass some of that payroll money, and in so doing, was apprehended. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do not be swerved from bringing in the only just verdict you can reach. Guilty of murder in the first degree. Well, it looks as if he's finally running down. Well, sir, since it was me and my late partner he was holding up, I guess I was pretty close, but when I started to pull my gun and start shooting, why, he wasn't so close anymore. And he kept getting further and further away each shot I took. That fellow over there, he fits what I saw. Only one thing, though. Can't understand why I missed hitting him. I'm a good shot. That's all. Thank you. Cross-examine? No questions. Prior to July 12th, Frank Dana's average balance in our bank was exactly $31.06. On that date, he made a cash deposit of $6,500 in new 10s and 20s. I was surprised at the amount, and I checked the serial numbers. It was part of the cash stolen in the armored car robbery, all right. Thank you. Your witness? Nothing. Well, how can you just sit there and let the district attorney get away with all those innuendos? Oh, remember your heartburn, Philip. Yes, sir, but... Philip, I... Philip, the DA's on our side. It's as though he knew exactly what we planned to do and was anxious to help set it up properly. Now watch, he's going to... Please call the defendant, Frank Dana, to the stand. See? All through these long weeks, Mr. Dana, you've repeated that Alice Blair gave you the money. And no such woman exists. The police have failed to find any evidence of her. But she did give it to me. You offer no other explanation in this courtroom now for having the money in your possession? No, sir. That's all. The prosecution rests. No questions, Your Honor. The witness may return to his seat. Ladies and gentlemen, I, uh... I don't want to delay this painful trial any more than necessary. Now, the case for the prosecution rests entirely on uh, circumstantial evidence. The fact that Frank Dana had in his possession $6,500, which was part of a robbery murder. But what about the balance of the money? A little matter of, uh, oh, of approximately $145,000. Well, Frank Dana swore on oath that a woman named Alice Blair gave him the $6,500. Now, the district attorney says that Alice Blair doesn't exist. I now call Alice Blair to the stand. Alice Blair? Can you take the stand, please, Miss Blair? The courtroom will settle down. Push your left hand on the Bible, please. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. State your name, please. Alice Blair. Be seated, Miss Blair. Miss Blair, District Attorney Mahaffey. 
Would you please tell the court... Uh, oh, I think you'd better use the microphone there. Alice, would you please tell the court, do you know Frank Dana? Yes. Did you give him $6,500 in new $10 and $20 bills? Yes. Did Frank know where the bills came from? No. No, he didn't. Thank you. Your witness, Pat. Your Honor, the prosecution requests a recess. This new element has changed the entire complexion of this case. Prosecution's request seems reasonable. If uh, defense counsel agrees, I will declare... No, sir. Your Honor, this trial has been delayed too many times already. <laughs> There's no doubt the complexion of the case has changed, but that isn't an excuse for recess. I respectfully submit that although the prosecution didn't find Alice Blair, they were told repeatedly of her existence by the defendant. Trial will proceed. Miss Blair, where did you get the... Object, Your Honor. The witness is not on trial. Sustain. How long have you known the defendant? Object, Your Honor. Irrelevant and immaterial. Your Honor, I wish to establish the relationship between the witness and the defendant to determine whether collusion is... That seems relevant and material. Objection overruled. Continue. Answer the question, please. How long have you known Frank Dana? About three months. Have you seen him often? I... Yes. Very often? Object, Your Honor. What do you mean by uh, very often, Mr. District Attorney? I mean simply, is she in love with him? Object, Your Honor. The line of questioning of the prosecution is leading and intended to form a conclusion in the minds of the jury. I don't think so. Overruled. Answer the question, Miss Blair. Am, am I in love with Frank? Yes, I am. Now... Being in love with him, naturally, you'd want to help him in any way you could. Object, Your Honor. Sustain, strike the question. Ever think of getting married to Frank Dana, Miss Blair? I... I... Answer the question, please. I object, Your Honor. I object to the whole line of cross-examination and repeat, the witness is not on trial. I think prosecution's line of question is eminently within bounds. Answer the question, Miss Blair. Did I ever think of marrying Frank? Are you married to him? Are you, Miss Blair? Or is it Mrs. Frank Dana? No, I'm not married to him. But you thought of it? Yes. Are you engaged to him? Well... Engaged to be married? Yes, I am. When had you planned on getting married to Frank Dana? Well, we were to be married... Until this trial came up and that sort of got in the way of it, is that right? That's right. As his prospective wife, didn't you think it would be a good idea to provide Frank Dana with an alibi? Wouldn't you say you gave him the money if you thought it would help your husband? I'm not married to him. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I submit witness testimony is worthless. Your Honor, uh, neither the witness nor my client informed me they were engaged to be married. Uh, in view of this uh, rather unexpected uh, situation here that exists, I, uh, well, I, I will accede to the state's desire for a recess. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> What's well, sauce for the goose, Donegan? Are you requesting a recess, Mr. Donegan? Well, no, Your Honor, I... I guess not. We'll just see how this thing winds up here. Proceed, Mr. District Attorney. No more questions, Your Honor. Redirect, Mr. Donegan. Yes, Your Honor. Now, uh, Alice, uh, if you'd known the money was from the robbery murder, you wouldn't have given it to Frank, would you? No. Well, why did you give it to him? I... I had an idea there might be something wrong. I just asked Frank to put it in a safe place. I wanted time to find out about it. Who gave it to you? Well, since you don't want to tell me who gave it to you, uh, even though Frank's freedom is at stake, it follows it must have been someone you're very fond of, some member of your family, or somebody you're in love with. Alice, uh, are your parents living? My mother. Where is she living? In Salt Lake City. How many members in your family? Just the three of us. Yourself, your mother, and uh, a sister? 
No. A brother. So it is a brother. Younger brother? Yes. And he gave you the money, didn't he? Alice, don't you realize he gave you the money to see if it could be passed? He used you. Why do you keep looking at the spectators? Is it possible that he's here to see how his trial is coming on? He is in the courtroom, isn't he? No. No, he isn't. Your Honor, I ask the court to bear with me for a moment. I think we can clear this case up right now. May I ask that every man in that section of the courtroom between the ages of 17 and 27 pass before the witness? Your Honor, must we be subjected to another of the great Michael Donegan's theatrical performances? Seems to me everything Mr. Donegan has said is uh, logical. Aren't you anxious to get at the truth of this matter? Yes, of course, Your Honor, but... Overruled. I direct the bailiff to assist defense counsel. All right, sir. All right, sir. All right, sir. Look at him, Alice. Your Honor, may I request that this young man be sworn in? Permission granted. Witness may be excused. You can sit down, Alice. Place your left hand on the Bible. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. State your name. Your name? All right, all right. I'm Tom Blair. Sit down, Tom Blair. Alice is your sister, isn't that right, Tom? So what? Uh, your Honor, I know I, I must sound like a broken record, but if we could just have a recess... All right, Tom, you gave your sister $6,500. Is that true? Don't you know that you're making Alice liable as an accessory? That's what you say. What did you do with the rest of the money, Tom? I don't know what you're talking about. Now, Tom... Hey, let go of me. Is it necessary to hold the witness while you question him, Mr. Donegan? Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Tom, what did you do with the rest of the money? I told you, I don't know what you're talking about. Look, Tom. Hey, look. what is this? I don't think he'll fly away, Mr. Donegan. Well, I'm sorry, Your Honor. My emotions ran away with me. Stand up, Tom. Stand up! You know, you're a pretty well-developed young man. Nice shoulders, nice chest. No. Take off your coat. No. Uh I think I know what Mr. Donegan's getting at. Take off your coat, young man. Uh, no, I... Uh, it won't be necessary, Your Honor. Yeah. Oh. Now, what could cause a bulge like that under your shirt? Maybe a bandage? Did you get yourself hurt, Tom? Maybe from a bullet? The guard couldn't understand how he missed you at such a close range. <laughs> he didn't miss you, did he, huh? All right. All right. I did it. I did it. Your Honor, defense rests. Mr. Donegan, thank you very much. All right, Frank. I'm sorry I didn't tell the whole truth. Well, that's understandable. You didn't know all the facts. Uh, because she ran away, I guess I wanted you to find her more than anything else. You know, I think you two kids should celebrate. I know a nice place. Next. I've got a place all picked up. Oh, you have? Goodbye, and thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. Ah, oh, it's a nice boy. Beautiful girl. It's too bad about a brother. Yeah, he's really in trouble. He's going to need a good attorney. Mr. Donegan, certainly. You're not now, considering... Up, you know the accused is always entitled to the best of defense. Even if he is guilty, there may be mitigating circumstances. Missing witnesses. Oh, Mr. Donegan. Shall we explore it over a couple of stakes at Nick's? Mr. Donegan! Oh, relax, Philip. He hasn't asked me. Did I give you a little heartburn there for a minute? Yes, Mr. Donegan. Well, don't worry. I got a little myself. Our star, Dick Powell, will return in a moment. Tonight's play was brought to you by the Singer Sewing Machine Company. Next week, your host will be the Parker Pen Company. Here within the cap of the all-new Parker 51, you find the world's smoothest riding pen point. It's Parker's exclusive new electro-polished point. The point that's made mirror smooth in an electro bat, which dissolves all the microscopic burrs and ridges found on ordinary points. The electro-polished Parker point is the smoothest you ever touch to paper. Try it tomorrow. The beautiful all-new electro-polished Parker 51, world's smoothest writing pen. Ladies and gentlemen, we in Four Star Playhouse and all the members of the singer organization thank you for being with us this evening. We hope you enjoyed the play. And we hope you'll be with us again next week.
Thank you and good night. presents Dick Powell, Charles Boyer, David Niven, Joan Fontaine. Tonight on Four Star Playhouse, we present Dick Powell in A Study in Panic. I've just finished reading yesterday's column on the fire. Uh-huh. Tonight at the fire on the west side, I saw the ugly face of panic. I saw civilized men clawing and smashing their way through women and children to save their own precious skins. What kind of men are these? The fear turns into jungle animals. It's pretty strong stuff, Fred. Oh, it's true. That's not the point. Do me a favor, will you, Fred, and leave the fires to our reporters? That's what they get paid for. People are supposed to turn to your column for charm, a few chuckles, and a little warmth. Okay, okay. Tomorrow night, back to normal. I'll interview Cuddles Laverne, Bubble Dancer Supreme. Do an obituary in the old Globe Theater they're tearing down. A lot of lively things like that. Nothing but chuckles and charm. Well, that's what the people want, Fred. That's what they want, that's what they get. Hey, Curly. Yes, Mr. Jordan? By any chance did you read my column tonight? Well, no, I, you see... Oh, I, I see. You never use the stuff, huh? Well, uh, uh, it's all right. It's all right. Don't worry about it. I was just wondering if I did go off the deep end. I'm afraid our ever-loving editor isn't too happy. Oh. That makes two of us. Well, well, and who is this? What's that got to do with it? Oh, a new proofreader, uh, Ella Graham. Major, applied psychology, result, girl, iceberg. <laughs> Don't worry about Curly, dear. He's in the difficult years, 14 to 40. Now, what was it you didn't like about my column? I knew your office would be like this. Oh? Sloppy. Oh, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home, I always say. But I knew you'd be like this. Sloppy man, sloppy office, sloppy mind. Do you care for a cup of sloppy coffee? No. Where did you learn your psychology? In a gutter. Oh, now, wait a minute. What kind of men are these that fear can turn into jungle animals? What kind of men do you suppose they are? They're men exactly like yourself. No, no, honey. I'm scared of bill collectors, cold germs, outrage, proofreaders, and a lot of things. But I can't see myself getting so worried about my own skin that I'd trample women and children. Mice, men, monkeys, and guinea pigs. They all respond to the stimuli of panic in precisely the same way. That, Mr. Jordan, is one of the basic principles of psychology. But of course, you wouldn't know about that. What are you so upset about? Didn't you ask yourself how these men are going to face their families after this column appears? All they did was react just the same as you would in the same situation. Yet you mount a pedestal and stand in judgment of them. I've got a nervous feeling you don't like me. Oh, it infuriates me to think that an untrained, uninformed primitive, primitive. is allowed to write such drivel and get it published. <laughs> well, at least my readers love me. After tonight, they won't. You'll get a hundred letters calling you a maladjusted, Ego sublimated. My readers? A hundred enraged letters. Well, my readers only get angry if I don't print their corny poems. A hundred letters. I'll bet you a dollar I don't get one. Bet you a dollar. Isn't that typical? 
reduce the whole argument to the level of a of a bookmaker. Oh, and another thing. I was afraid of that. You spell like a two-year-old. It's I before E, except after C. Will you try to remember that? Yes, ma'am. I'll get myself a dictionary. Yep, 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 yep. Take it. Why? I want you to write, Dear Mr. Jordan, on that. Now, go ahead. Look, I'm very busy. We'll play these kitty games some other time, all right? Then write, You are too smug, Mr. Jordan. Oh, that I'll do. Oh, by the way, gentlemen, this is the Mr. Jordan who spells so atrociously. Thank you. I've only known him five years. Now try with your left hand. Happy to. You are far too smug, Mr. Jordan. Well, okay. You should have taken me up on a bet of the dollar. You've got letters. I knew it. Letter, singular. Very singular. Dear Mr. Jordan, I was thoroughly annoyed by your column concerning panic. Obviously, you are far too smug, and you lack the proper respect for fear, Mr. Jordan. Here, somebody feels the way I do. So I'm taking it upon myself to teach you about fear. Sometime during the next 24 hours, I'm going to kill you. Kill you? Anonymous. I want you to be constantly on guard, wondering if I'm the man next to you in the crowded bar. Now, what would I be doing in a bar? Or coming down some lonely street or waiting for you in the shadows. <laughs> oh, brother, brother, when will we face each other? How will I strike? For the answer to these and many other questions, tune in tomorrow, same time, same station. Oh, don't throw it away. Well, where's he from? Well, there's a postmark on the envelope, a little town called Silver Springs, about 10 miles from here. You should report it to the police. The man might be a homicidal paranoic or something. Oh, relaxed. Every cognomist gets a dozen of these letters a month from screwballs trying to give themselves a cheap thrill. Doesn't mean a thing. Oh. I just thought you wanted to read it. Just a minute. You took a sample of my handwriting. You thought I wrote it. Well, you said here's someone who believes the same as I do, unquote. Oh, of all the nerve. <laughs> homicidal paranoic. How do you spell that? Hi, Joe. Oh, hi, Mr. Jordan. What's new? Yeah, nothing. No fights, no excitement, <laughs> no customers. Yeah, it's quiet all over. I'm going to have a rough night filling a column. Yeah. Well, if I could do... Hey, hey, there's a, there's a dame looking for you. She's been in and out a couple of times. Said she'd be back. I don't know what she... Here she is. Well, Madam Freud, as I live and breathe. And you won't be doing either very long if you don't call the police. What do you mean? That maniac from Silver Springs. He telephoned the newspaper tonight trying to locate you. Oh, really? All right, Mr. Know-it-all. There are the telephone calls. He called four times. How did you get mixed up in this? As I was leaving the office, I heard Helen at the switchboard trying to page you. She said you had an urgent call from Silver Springs. He sounded very excited, almost incoherent. Tell the police that he's obviously a paranoid, probably stemming from I'm some sort of... I'm not going to tell the police anything. I'll get this screwball on the phone and read the riot act to him. That won't do any good. Hello, long distance? I want Silver Springs 90605. Mm -hmm. Oh, and reverse the charges. Hey, Joe. Hmm? Yeah? Put one hand on the menu and raise the other one. If you want, I should testify about the soup. All I can promise is... It's wet. I'll have a large one. You want something? No, nothing, thanks. How'd you find me? Oh, they gave me a complete list of your schedule for the evening, which includes, I understand, an interview with Cuddles Laverne. Oh, yes, lovely girl. She's not an iceberg. Oh, why don't they answer? Give him time. He's got to take off his horn. Oh? Okay. Well, all right, operator, cancel it. Oh, I can see him just sit there in the dark listening to the telephone ring. Laughing like a loon. What's the matter? That man over there. He was staring at you so while you were on the phone. Oh? 
There's a whole restaurant to choose from. Why would he sit right there? Well, it's a free country. What kind of place are you running here anyway? Giving an old customer like Mr. Jordan cold soup. It wasn't cold when I put it down a few seconds ago. It's all right. No, no. If the lady says it's cold, I'll change it. So, it's a break for the cat. No, don't do that. Don't give it to the cat. Well, why not give it to the cat, friend? I ask you a question. Please. Be careful. What's wrong with giving the soup to the cat? Something the matter with the soup, friend? Why all the interest in my soup while I was at the telephone? I ask you a question. Why the interest in the soup? Don't you know? It's written all over my face. I'm hungry. It's hungry. When I thought of giving that soup to the cat, I... Oh, it's all right. It's all right. I'm sorry. Here, sit down. Joe, my soup's all right. Give him a fresh bowl, will yeah, you? Yeah, sure. Thank you. There. Come with me. Look there. See that bench out there? That's a bus stop. Now, you go sit on that bench until the bus comes. Then get on the bus and go home. When you get home, curl yourself up with all those fancy books of yours and read about what makes people tick. Now, get out of here. I was wrong, and I'm terribly sorry. But that doesn't alter the fact that a man has threatened to kill you and might be on his way here now. Good night, dear. Good night. Good night. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Take a look. Too much mascara. It's a whole notice. Yeah. So where were we? Well, you were giving me a little monologue about how Junior couldn't digest cow's milk. Oh, don't call him Junior. His name is Thomas Lester Bentley. Timmy, for short. Well, before we get into that, would you mind telling me about that raid in Chicago last month when the judge made you do your act of... Oh, later, later. So let me tell you this. This poor kid of mine, he loses six pounds in less than three weeks. My hubby and I were worried sick. You're not writing any of this down. I had a good memory. Well, anyway, let me tell you this. When we find out he's allergic... That's my cue. Oh. I'll need that one, too. Okay. Oh, don't go away. I love talking to you. Oh, Mr. Jordan. Oh, no, it can't be. You took the wrong bus, huh? Oh, I went on home, but I, I, I nearly went out of my mind thinking about what might happen to you. Would you please stop worrying about me? I went back to Joe's place, but you'd already left. Then I remembered where you would be. We're back on that mad killer kick again. Will you do one thing for me, please? And don't lie. My father keeps this in a closet for protection. Take it easy with that thing. Would you please carry it tonight for me? First of all, you've got to have a license to carry one of these things. And second, I'm more afraid of this than I am the mad killer. And third, it is loaded. Now take it back to your father and put it in the closet where you got it. I guess I've just made a fool of myself again, haven't I? Ella, Ella, listen. I'm very grateful you thought enough to bother, but please stop worrying about me. Our mad killer is sound asleep in Silver Springs. That I can assure you. You really believe that, don't you? I've got to believe it. If I begin by being afraid of what I'm going to run into out there in the night, I might as well start covering wedding receptions and flower shows. I like the city at night, and I'm just not the type to be afraid. I guess I not only made a fool of myself, I wasted my time. Oh, boogeyman. You must be the one that's been calling Mr. Jordan from Silver Springs. Yes. Well, I don't know exactly where to find him. He's stopping several places. I do know that he's covering a story at the Old Globe Theater sometime tonight. Uh, if you'll wait just a minute, I'll try to give you a list of some of his stops. Morning Express. Yes, he is. I'll connect you. Morning Express.
I've been waiting for you. For me? You? Bonnie Prince Charlie, the man of the flying trapeze, the soldered swat. Anybody with a cigarette and a social conscience. Keep up. And the light, if you will. An unlit cigarette isn't worth much. I bless you. You have made me the king of the night. Till dawn, I shall stand here listening to the sounds of the dying world, listening to the sluggish thunder of a million hearts. It's pretty good. Sluggish thunder of a million hearts. Well, it's been a lean night for my column. 50 cents a line, standard fee. Hey, wait a minute. I thought you were going to stay and listen to the sounds of a dying world. The gurgle of muscatel at 49 cents a quart is also a lovely sound, my friend. something for me. Send them with the boys down to the morgue and get some pictures of the old Globe Theater, will you? I'm, I'm right outside of it now. Yeah, I want some pictures, oh, 40, 50 years ago when it was in all its glory. That's right. Put them on my desk, will you? Yes, Mr. Jordan. Oh, by the way, did he reach you all right? Who? The man from Silver Spring. What are you talking about? Well, he was in the office just about an hour ago looking for you. I told him the only place I was sure you'd be was at the theater. You mean he really came in? Oh, come on, Helen. You're not in cahoots with that Ella. <laughs> Helen, call the police and tell them to get out of here as fast as they can. Hey, I'm sorry to cut you short like this, but we don't have a phone at home and there's none around for blocks. I'll get it right back to you in just a minute. Okay. Gee, thanks very much. I'm so nervous, I'm rocking inside. Hello, Dr. Barnett. This is Harry Kagan. Listen, my wife's getting her pains every three minutes now. Oh, about a half hour ago, yeah. Yeah, okay, right away. Well, it's all yours. I gotta get back to Thelma. I wish us luck, huh? I hope it's twins. Oh, no, we got a set of them. Oh, Helen, it's me again. Oh, Mr. Jordan, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just getting like an old maid in my declining years. <sighs> you scared me out of five years' growth. Did you call the police? Well, sure I did. Well, call them back and tell them never mind. What is this? Do it right away, will you? I'll be the laughing stock of the town. Yeah, that little dame still got me on the merry-go-round. I'm going to take a look inside the theater and then come on in. Okay. Tonight, all by myself, I attended a wake. I walked amid the crumbling ruins of the old Globe Theater, whose bones are now being cleared away to make room for what? A pretzel factory or a parking lot? All in the name of sweet progress. Southern and Marlowe recited Shakespeare from the stage. John Barrymore thundered and roared and raged on this stage. Otis Skinner, John Drew, 
the list is endless. Yes, but where are you? I see you. You're almost here. Almost here. All right, I'm coming. I knew you'd find me, Mr. Jordan. How'd you know my name? How'd you know my name? Answer me! Answer me! How did you know my name? Jordan! Jordan! Uh, Brad, Brad, what is this? Captain! Say, what is this? What happened? Your office phoned and said you'd be down here. Well, this guy from Silver Springs came in town looking for me. I... I know. He just came into headquarters and I brought him down here with me. You what? I don't know what to say. Are you the fellow who sent the letter? No. I'm a guard down there at the sanitarium. It was one of the patients. I should have known better, but he seemed so rational at the time. One of the inmates gave Mr. Harris the letter and asked him to mail it for him as a favor. Like a fool, I did. He told me it was just a letter of appreciation for your fine column. Then after I mailed it, he told me what he'd written. That's why I've been trying to reach you. Mr. Jordan, I, I could get fired if you found out about that letter. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Come on, follow me, quickly. How is he? The doc says he's got a broken leg and suffering from shock, but he'll be all right. He'll be back in a couple of months watching the new plays. If there's anything for him to watch. Oh, the poor guy. He was lighting the lamps for you when the stairway collapsed. Oh, that's how he knew my name. You know, Captain, I'll let you in on a little secret. If you hadn't come in when you did, I'd have run out of here like an animal. Something I never knew existed took over my nerves, my, my mind, my body. Raw panic. Well, it's human nature. Forget it. No, I'm not going to forget it. I'm going to write about it. That's the least I can do. Down to the last minute detail, down to the last squeal of what fear did to me. I can say that no man has the right to stand on a pedestal and point the finger of shame at another. 
Well, it's none of my business, but I don't go for those deep columns of yours. I like them when they've got a laugh, a joke, a poem, chuckles and chime. Yeah, that's it. Well, you better not buy the paper tomorrow. Well, it's getting late. I better run along. Got a lot to do. Got to get cleaned up. Make a phone call, write a column, and, oh, buy a dictionary. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Four Star Playhouse and all the members of the Bristol Myers organization, thank you for being with us this evening. I hope you enjoyed our play and that you'll be with us again next week. Good night. Playhouse presents Dick Powell, Charles Boyer, David Niven, Ida Lupino. Please, I'll be checking out tomorrow. <laughs> Don't let this bother you. It's a typewriter, not a time bomb. I know. Sign here, please. You're David Sheridan, aren't you? Yes. I've watched your program. I've always enjoyed it. Thank you. Can't imagine what you're doing here in Haydenville. Oh, you can't? Is there a telephone in my room? No, just the one here. Well, may I? Distance phone call, please. Thank you. I want to talk with Mr. Ed Logan in Chicago. You can reach him at the United Broadcasting System. That's right, Logan. Ed Logan. And please reverse the charges. My name is David Sheridan. Thank you. No, thank you. Is the story really this important, Mr. Sheridan? Depends on what you mean by this important. Important enough to bring you here. <laughs> you flatter me, miss. News is important. I'm not. I'm just here for the story. Then you'll televise it, coast to coast. Mm hmm Well, hello. Hello, Ed. Yeah, yeah, I'm calling for a little town named Haydenville. Just east of Columbus, about 20, 30 miles. Yeah, I was finishing up on that strike story in Columbus, and I heard what happened down here. It seems that a boy named Fulton was being held in jail on a murder charge, and about three hours ago, some 400-odd public-spirited citizens broke down the jail and held a lynching party. Yeah, that's right. I got her on the wire and took a taxi down here. All things are rather quiet now, hardly anybody on the streets. Well, Ed, send a cameraman down here, will you? Make it Sam Baker if he's free. Yeah, I'll spend tonight here, and tomorrow morning, if Sam can get some pictures, I'll use the story as a feature on tomorrow night's program. Yeah. Yeah, I want to take what happened in this pigsty and make the whole country conscious of it. What's the name of this hotel? Baxter. Uh, I'm staying at the Baxter Hotel, Ed. I'll be back in Chicago tomorrow afternoon. That'll give us plenty of time to develop the film and clear the story. Right. So long. Will it do any good, Mr. Sheridan? Featuring the story on your program, I mean. Well, it's news. That's my business. It's not news anymore. It won't be tomorrow night. The wire services have all carried it. Any paper that wants to mention it will do just that in the morning. 
I'm sure they will. Maybe I think it's big enough for more than one mention. Will it help? <laughs> May I have my key, please? You know you're very inquisitive. I can't help it. This is my town. After all happened. Oh, I don't know, it's hard to say, but it was all so horrible. Everyone in the town feels that way. They're ashamed, and they want to forget it. Well, when a child breaks a lamp on purpose, he'd like to forget it, too. Especially when his father lays him over his knee. Was that why you're here? To spank the town, Mr. Sheridan? I came for a feature story, miss. Not an argument. Oh, after I get settled, I want to talk to the police chief. Could you tell me where I could find him? Down the street, about a block. Oh, and then you must have heard all the commotion from here. Tell me, while 400 people were killing a man, what were the other 500 people in this town doing? I don't know about the others. I was very busy. Busy? I was praying. Let me get you a version of what happened, Chief. Yeah, I see. Look, Mr. Sheridan, it all happened so quickly. Well, I thought it best that I get the truth from you, otherwise I just might have to pick up gossip from the street. Let's go into my office. Like I was saying, there was a man here from the Columbus Wire Service a short while ago. He got the cold facts. Well, Chief, I think I'd like more than the cold facts. I I'd like all the facts. All right, here they are. Boy, his name was Fulton, Richard Fulton. Around noon today, he broke into old Mrs. Winslow's home. Figured she was out. Mrs. Winslow was a sweet woman. The whole town loved her. When she discovered Fulton looting her house, she screamed. He beat her with a poker. Are you sure of that? He was caught leaving the house. And he confessed when we brought him in here. That's his signature below his words. Go on, please. Now, well, like I say, everybody loved old Mrs. Winslow. That Fulton was a no-good kid. Word got around what he'd done to Ms. Winslow. The whole town seemed to go nuts. People started gathering in bunches to talk it over. And then talk started getting wild. And you didn't send for reinforcements? No. I didn't figure they'd really do anything. I, I figured it was just talk. Well, I know most of the folks in that mob, Mr. Sheridan. I, I didn't think. I still can't believe it. No. Tommy, did uh, Fulton have any family? Yeah, father. Pretty old man. He's in the lockup now. We figured it'd be safer for him there than at home alone. Hmm. I'd like to talk to him, if I may. I'm afraid you'll have to wait till morning. He was so upset we had the doc give him a sedative. Ah. Oh. In that case, I'll go question some of the townspeople. I'm afraid you won't find many. This is a small town, Mr. Sheridan. Folks around here go to bed early. Do they dream? These folks around here, Chief, do they dream? What do you mean? Oh, nothing much. I just hate to count all the nightmares tonight. All right, thank you. Any messages for me? Yes, there was a message from Chicago. They said to tell you that a Mr. Sam Baker would be able to be here by morning. Thank you. Oh, by the way, is there any place open around here where I might get something to eat? No, most places here close early. I could fix you a sandwich and a cup of coffee, though. I'll bring it up to your room for you. Thank you. Appreciate it. He's in room five. Thanks for calling, Carol. Right. My name's Fielding, Bruce Fielding. May I come in, please? Please do. Thank you. Want you sit down? Oh, thanks again. Uh, I've come to talk to you about your program, your television program. Oh, yes, I imagine you did. Mr. Sheridan, I'm acting mayor of Haydenville. The regular mayor's quite ill, so I'm more or less in charge. Miss Baxter told me that I might find you here. Oh, I see. She also told me that you intend to feature what happened here tonight on your television program. And I've come to ask you to please reconsider. Oh. Mr. Sheridan, what happened here tonight is deplorable. There's no question about that. But a small town like this goes on year after year in a very inconspicuous way. It never gets any publicity. Most people don't even know where it's located. Then suddenly it's to be publicized for this, well, this accident. 
Now, that can do a great deal of harm. Some people might even move out of town. And a few industries that we hope might come here will probably change their minds. In other words, it's a shame that Richard Fulton was hanged. It's bad publicity. Mr. Sheridan, please don't misunderstand me. I'm sorry for what happened tonight. I think we all are. But you're right. Just now, I am concerned mostly with the publicity. I don't see what good running the story on your program can possibly do for Richard Fulton. And it can hurt Haydenville's future. That's my concern. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Fielding, is it? Yes. No. Uh, Mr. Fielding, I can understand your, your position, but I think probably you should try and understand mine. My business is news. And a good definition of news is anything that happens that's out of the ordinary. Now, I'd hate to think that lynching is ordinary in this country. I see. <laughs> well, I still hope that you'll reconsider. Now, I'm not just a small-town politician. I know my way around pretty well. We're not a rich town, but we do have enough money for certain uh, necessities. Now, I brought a good deal of cash with me. No one need know anything about this. If you'll just name the amount... Or... Get out of here. Well, I thought... Uh, out. Oh. Uh, maybe I made a mistake. You did. Uh, well, uh, no offense, Mr. Sheridan. Uh, good night. Brought your sandwich and coffee. Put it on the table, please. And do me a favor, will you? Don't send any more visitors to see me. I was only trying to help. Help who? You, Mr. Sheridan. You've come here to lambaste a town you don't even know. You've said it's a pigsty full of stupid people, and you're here to play judge and punish our sins. You read too many books. I told you it's a story, that's all. I understand how you feel about a man's right to a fair trial having been denied. But a mob doesn't think about rights. Do you understand how a mob works? Do you know what can happen? Put her up, okay? Let me go, let me go! Hey, Bill! Grab that kid! Got him? Take your hands off me! You can't do this to Freddy! You can't! Oh, Freddy Jack! No, don't do it! You can't! You can't! Freddy! Sheridan, I asked you a question. I heard you. Do I know about mobs? I know all I care to know about them. You say you didn't see what happened here tonight. Well, I did. Not tonight, but a long time ago. I saw a man I loved, an old man who used to play with me and make toys for me. I saw him dragged out of a jail and lynched. I was only 12, but they held me and I watched. The next day, they found out old Freddy was innocent. Everybody was ashamed, but that didn't bring him back. I'm sorry. I didn't know this was something personal with you. Well, it's personal, all right. I'm older now, and I can't be held. And you're right. I don't know your town. I don't care to. Got 400 stupid people who made up a mob, and I don't like mobs. Shall I wake you in the morning? Don't worry. I won't oversleep. No, I don't imagine you will. Tomorrow's too important, isn't it? Tomorrow you dissect a town. What would you call it, Mr. Sheridan? A day of revenge? Well, there it is, Sam. Haydenville. Yeah, I missed seeing it when I came in. I must have blinked. You sure this town hanged a guy? Don't look like enough people to pull a rope. Well, they're all home, probably. I want you to get a shot of the street, the jail, the tree where they hung him, everything. Cover the town from top to bottom. I could do that with a brownie. We'll make it fast. We can get a train out here at 1 o'clock. OK, but where do I find everything? The tree, the jail, you know. Well, use your head. Ask somebody. I'll go with you myself, but I need more copy. Where will I meet you? Right here, before 12. This man wants to see you, Mr. Fulton. Uh, Mr. Fulton, I'm a reporter. What is it you want? Well, I realize it may be difficult for you, but I would like to hear your version of what happened. 
There's only one version of what happened. Sickness. A great sickness. My son was sick. Many said he was a bad boy, a no good boy. My son was a sick boy. And when his sickness made him kill an old woman, others grew sick. And their sickness killed my boy. Did you have him? I saw them drag Richard out of the cell. I heard them yelling and screaming, but God was good. He allowed me to be struck unconscious then. I see. No one can see. When Richard was a little boy, he fell in the creek and he called out to me, Daddy, Daddy. I went and pulled him out. And then he grew up, and I was no longer daddy, but Pop. Last night, he saw my face in that sea of angry people. I couldn't get to him, but I heard him calling to me. Daddy. Daddy. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. Thank you. Daddy. I hope you got everything you wanted, Mr. Sheridan. I did, thank you. Good. Your public's probably very interested in your opinion of what happened. Oh, I think you'll be more interested in the kind of people that hang a man. Tell me, what time does this program of yours go on the air? Shortly after 7, I do a segment of the news roundup. I'll be watching. Well, I hope you will be. In fact, I hope your whole town will be watching. How you doing, Sam? Well, I shot all the town streets, the town hall, the tree, even the house where Fulton killed old lady Winslow. This ought to wrap it up. Good. Got it. Now, oh, 11 o'clock. We'll get that 1 o'clock train easily. Swell. I'm anxious to get back. I left a cute little blonde in the bar last night. <laughs> you think she'll still be there? Yeah, she's not very bright. I told her I had to go out and buy a postage stamp. Now I'll tell her it got stuck to my tongue and took a long time to get loose. Mr. Sheridan, there's a message for you. You're to call Chicago, operator 23. Oh, thank you. Sam, take the machinery, will you? Hello, operator. This is David Sheridan. I have a message to call Chicago, operator 23. Would you get them for me, please? Yes, thank you. Sam, why don't you go out to the room, take a rest before train time? I can use it. I feel like number 19 in a 20 mule team. Yeah, you look the part, too. Wait a minute. Better take the key, and I'll use breaking down the door. Finished your business? Yes, sir. Got everything you wanted? Everything, thank you, yes. Uh, hello? Oh, hello. Yes, Ed. Yes? Yes, we washed everything up just a little while ago. Well, we can get a train out of here at 1 o'clock for Columbus, and then we'll fly over. Should be there on 5. That's right. No, I'm happy with it. You just make sure the lab's clear to take care of Sam's film. Right. See you soon. Well, that's that. Mm-hmm. That's that. And now you go back to Chicago and tell the world what you think of Haydenville? Well, let's say a watered-down version. Mr. Sheridan, would you do me a favor? That depends. I'd like to borrow an hour of your time and show you Haydenville. I've seen it, Miss Baxter. Have you? You've seen a jail, a tree, and a heartbroken old man. I'd like to show you more. Please? Well, as long as we can be back within the hour. It'll take less than an hour. Or it'll take forever. That's getting colder. I was born in this town. I lived here all my life. Who were you born, Mr. Sheridan? Small town, Arkansas. You've gone back recently? No. Oh, that's too bad. I can imagine leaving the town I was born in, but not forever. Hey, you. 
Hey! You're that television guy, ain't you? Well, here I am. Charlie, you, you better go home. You stay out of this, Carol. This guy came here to find out what happened last night, didn't he? Well, let him get a good story. You want a good story, don't you? That's right. Okay, then I was there. I helped. I helped swing old Mrs. Winslow's killer to a tree, so there. Go on, tell the world. Tell him Charlie Barnes tied the knot. I don't care. I ain't sorry, you see. Didn't mean a thing to me. You always drink your breakfast? Look, so I had a few drinks. So what? So I got a cold, that's all. I just want to make one thing clear. I ain't sorry, you understand? Fulton had it coming to him. Mrs. Winslow was the sweetest old lady in this town, and he beat her brains out. He had it coming, and I ain't sorry. You got that straight? I ain't sorry. You go on home now, Charlie. I just ain't sorry. I just ain't sorry. One of Haydenville's vicious beasts, Mr. Sheridan. Charlie's a carpenter, has a nice wife and three sons. I've never seen him drunk before. He was pretty upset. He's human. Did you bring me out here to interview the population? No, I brought you out to show you the town, the town as I know it. I wanted you to see the church that the townspeople built with their own hands. I wanted you to see the park where the children play. Surely you can't hate our children, too, Mr. Sheridan. I want you to see this town as it is. One question. Why? Why go to all the trouble to show me around? What's the point? Because you're an intelligent person, Mr. Sheridan. If you weren't, I couldn't expect anything. And just what do you expect? A fair trial. Stand by, Mr. Sheridan. And that takes care of the international situation. Now we switch you to Chicago for today's feature story and David Sheridan. Good evening. In your newspapers today, there appeared a story a told of an incident which took place in a small town in Ohio. Last night at approximately 7 o'clock, 400 of the town's 900 citizens rushed the town jail and dragged Richard Fulton from the arms of the law. He was hanged nearby. When I heard about it, I was very angry. I went there. I wanted to see this town of 900 where a mob had lynched Richard Fulton without benefit of a fair trial. The name of the town is unimportant, but what happened there is important, and there's no excuse for it. When I returned to Chicago late this afternoon, I called two psychologists and asked them about mob violence. This is what they told me. Anyone is vulnerable to mob hysteria. An average man is three times as likely to accept suggestions in a mob as he is when alone, no matter how wild or unreasonable that suggestion may be. The mob member ceases to reason as an individual and is swept along with the mob without reflecting or criticizing what he normally might condemn. That is what I was told. I believe it can happen to anyone, anywhere. If he allows himself to become a member of a mob and discards his own reason, for the unreasoning passion of a crowd. I didn't intend to speak like this tonight. As I said, I went to the town because I was angry. A man had been hanged without benefit of a fair trial. I hated the town before I got there. I hated it even more while I was there. I thought its people were an ignorant, stupid form of beast. I hated them and their town because of what had happened. And then, before I was to leave, a young woman made me take one hour of thought, one hour of quiet reason. She showed me around the town I hated. Yes, I saw the jail from where Richard Fulton was dragged. I also saw a plaque commemorating nine young men who had given their lives in the war. I saw the tree where Richard Fulton was hanged. I also saw three churches that were well filled on Sunday. Yes, I saw many things during that hour, but only two really important things both sides of a story. You see, I had been like a mob. I had gone to that town to lynch it because of the terrible thing it had done. And the important thing that the town had denied Richard Fulton, I had denied that town. A fair trial. 
This is in no way an effort to minimize or excuse or even whitewash the incident. Last night, a mob committed murder. 400 citizens, men and women, put a young man to death. I won't forget what happened last night. None of us should. A mob is a vicious, frightful thing, and we should all condemn it. But what we must keep in mind is that these criminals, these murderers, were men and women not unlike ourselves. People who traded their reasons for the blind emotions of a mob. One day, they will meet the highest judge of all. Let him condemn them or pity them, but let us not imitate them. Fear what happened last night. Fear it because it could happen to you. The only effective way to avoid mob violence is to refuse to let yourself become part of a mob. I repeat, it could happen to you. God forbid that it does. Good night.